especially how's it going man it's been so how long has it been i think the last time we linked up probably around 2000 i know it was at least between 2012 and 2015 because that was still i was stationed at washington Washington. yeah that's right that's right you'd come down for a brief late you had like a brief layover and we met up for for lunch down in seattle yeah that's right yeah your wife was there i think what some you had your little one there maybe or maybe yeah he's he's 16 now but yeah the 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 little one at the time and you had oh you had gosh, your I, can't, there, so. I can't believe it's been that long i mean your daughter just graduated high school right so she was still running around like you know we were corralling our kids we'll just say that much yeah yeah and, and now they're you know, in high school <laughs> or out of high school right you know, my oldest is in college so <laughs> man so uh there you're the reason man i number one you're one of my best friends so i that's the reason i wanted to have you on but also your career has been it's been awesome, but it's also been like so unique. So I think it's a good story to start. I mean, I, I don't know. Do you want to recap the whole thing and then go through each thing? Or do you want to like go chronologically and then kind of surprise people with what you've done? Or what do you think? I think I'll just start off with covering it real quick in total. That way, you know, folks don't have to wait on the edge of their seat or, you know, tune out because, you know, it's just taking too long to get anywhere. Sure. Um, you yep. kind of set it up, right? So. You're right. It's been a, a very unique career, uh, so much so that, you know, the different badges and ribbons that are on my military uniform, I get stopped in the Pentagon when I'm all the time. I think people think that, you know, I'm, I'm stolen valor. Like I just go to the PX <laughs> or the PX and, and pick out any ribbon or or pin that I want to and just throw it on the uniform and, and see if anybody catches me. So right. I do you actually field a lot of questions for folks when they're when they're kind of eyeing me up and down when I'm in my blues or even my. Oh, but my uh, OCPs since you know, we got the badges on there too. Um, but it started in, in 2000 uh, when I came into the air force and I enlisted in the air force and became a tactical air control party uh, member. So I spent the first 10 years of my military service doing that. And, you know, shortly after I came in, as you know, we had nine 11 and that set off a, you know, a flurry of deployments and activity over the next 10 years or so so that i was enlisted right. in the air force uh, the last five of which uh, in 2005 and we'll get to this later in more detail you know i was finally like kind of reached my my tactical goal and and was selected to to go and be attack p and, and support the second ranger battalion uh, which you know led to many deployments and lots of operations so yeah i do that for five years and you know, during that time period, I had got my bachelor's degree, started my master's, and I was about finished with it. And I started thinking, you know, I think I reached I reached the tactical pinnacle, I thought to myself at the time. And I wanted to start thinking beyond, you know, the, the leading edge of the battlefield and what else can I bring? And I decided ultimately that I wanted to commission. And, and I was also, though, tired of kind of doing my same job, as you know, and, and others who have been, you know, joint terminal attack controllers out on the battlefield, the especially in a direct action sense, you know, the, the mission can get kind of repetitive you know, as far as the planning and the execution and come back. It's kind of all the same process. And I was really burnt out. And I decided to commission in the United States Navy. Um, That's awesome. The reason being is, is Air Force is like, one, there was no TACP officer career field at the time. Like they had just got into beta testing and I didn't even know that was a, a, an, an option. Like I heard right. about it almost last minute. And the Air Force is like, well, it takes six months for the next board, and then it's going to be like a three or four month process to figure out if you're selected and you get a cl- get a class date. Bottom line is just going to take forever. I was already at nine or nine years, eight months about when I when I, well actually when I commissioned, but I want to get the show on the road. And the Navy is like, Psh, we can take you like in three. <laughs> <laughs> just get our package and we'll get it done and we'll get you a class date. And that's what happens. So I went to the Navy and was stationed down in San Diego on a cruiser. I was a service warfare officer. And within that time period, the TACP stood up the TACP officer program, you know, in earnest, like it, it was official, like we're launching yeah. with And I was doing really well in the Navy. Um, I was, you know, enjoying it, actually. And I just felt this feeling that I had to come back and try to help stand up, you know, this community, this career field of ours. And I asked my captain, he said, sure. And I entered service transferred back to the Air Force in August of 2012. Nice. And from there, I've been a TACP officer and doing uh, different things. I've only spent, in the last 12 years, I've only spent four years in an operational squadron. So I've been doing a lot of operational work, strategic work, uh, both on a, in a training capacity. And then my last assignment on the the, staff, the current operations staff at Joint Special Operations Command. 
yeah. and then working as a strategic advisor to the commanding general at JSOC, which was I mean, so eye-opening and exactly where oh, I went. Yeah. And then from there, I was selected to be a legislative fellow. So I turned in my uniform and put on a suit, and the Department of Defense assigned me to the office of Representative Matt Gates out of Florida's first district. Oh, how hands. about that? Yeah. Then I returned back to the Hurlburt Roots, where we all kind of start, well, now, or most of us who are older, started our TACP journey. It was right there at, at Hurlburt. And, you know, he, him and I are the same age. So we were probably running around the same circles that, as 18 year olds in the pan. Right. <laughs> yeah, trying to figure out our lives. And yeah. that's where I'm at now. And I'm getting ready to leave that, his office and get end of December. And I'll be a congressional liaison for the Air Force to the House of Representatives after that. Nice. In a it's nutshell. Such an- eclectic like uh diverse and unique career whatever but then when you came back i was like man that's such a great pickup because you had all that tech p time plus ranger time and now you're now you had like a bunch of navy time of different uh different viewpoint on you know different service that kind of thing and you're bringing that all back to our career field i thought so it it actually made me a better air force officer as well that's i'll bet i ended up being on a guided missile cruiser out of san diego the uss bunker hill and in the way the Navy fights their, around the carrier strike group concept, they you know every ship has a, has a mission or a role. And the cruiser is captained by an 06 because the captain of that uh, vessel is the captain or the, the commander for all uh, air defense for the strike group. Okay. So in that process, I was able to learn about counter air and you know offensive counter air, defensive counter air, and, and all this different area of warfare that the Air Force is really into is one of the primary mission sets that as counter land folks like you and I are, mm-hmm. you know, I hadn't really no clue about. So it right. really opened my eyes into command and control of the skies to fighting an air war. And it, it kind of br- brung it all together, the counter air and the counter land doctrine that the Air Force has. And my understanding just exploded. Nice. It was fantastic. When I came back to the Air Force. I found myself, you know, Having an easier time when I was at the you know, my deployment at the ASOC, the Air Support Operations Center, or, or dealing with the A, the Air Operations Center, like I I kind of understood what they were doing now, right. other than what I wanted them to do for us. Yeah, right. Like you saw the big picture. Yeah, that's right. Just like my little piece. Yeah, that's right. Well, cool, man. Uh, so let's back up. Let's tell me tell me like when you came in. Like, did you go? What was your first assignment? And then after that, how did you transition into to the Rangers? And and we'll just go from there. We'll just start. Picking that apart. You want back? So I came in in July of 2000 and, and graduated boot camp in September. And, you know, the the special war, what is now the special warfare career fields, you know, TAC, TAC-P, combat control, pararescue, they're supposed to come in early on in boot camp because at the time, you know, boot camp was only six, six weeks long. Right. And they're supposed to come in like week two to try to recruit at the time. And they didn't show up. Uh, till about week five, like our orders for our jobs are already cut, and TACP recruiter shows up. And, you know, Sergeant Harris was his name. Yeah, he was his first name. And he gives us this pitch, and it looks really cool. There's explosions, of course, and there's you know <laughs> paratroopers. It was probably like a VHS tape at the time, <laughs> right? It wasn't on the. <laughs> they weren't streaming anything. And myself and another. Uh, guy Salim Shrani who ended up being a Ranger attack P as well later down the line. Him and I were in the boot camp class. Okay, and we came in to the career field together, but we tried out and we we passed the test. We, he walked us both down to the personnel station. They printed out my orders, which had security forces on it. Oh no! He crossed them out with a sharpie, <laughs> which wrote one Charlie Four attack P on it. Nice. And gave it back to the the lady. And next thing you know, I had her to Herbert. So it, it was really a whirlwind of time. I had no clue what I was getting into either. I, yeah. I didn't know much about anything. I didn't know anything about the Air Force. Like I came in open general, so I didn't have any jobs in mind. But right. you know, I was I was an athlete in high school and I, you know, I, I liked to keep fit and I, you know, it just sounded like something that, you know, would be a good fit for me. And right. It, it was a it ended up being one of the best random decisions that I ever made. You know, in life. Yeah, set you on a, a pretty good path. It did, it, but it started off bumpy. Like I, I barely got through tech school. Oh, really? I was a, uh, as you know, I was a smart ass. Like I, I, <laughs> yeah. I had well, an attitude. Yeah, and I was always trying to be the class clown. And I actually, it's funny. Uh, one of the instructors, 
approached me early on in training after I've just been getting smoked constantly because I was a smart ass. Right. He sat me down and he said, you know what the problem with you is, is that you're too much of attack P and you haven't even graduated yet. <laughs> like you need to learn your place, right? There's plenty yeah. of time to be a smart ass attack P down the road, but you're right. not there yet. And I just didn't understand that. And yeah, I was exposed to a lot of things that I wasn't familiar with. Like I wasn't an outdoorsy type guy. So like hiking through the Florida woods at night was uncomfortable for me. Yeah. And I really struggled. I got washed back a flight and, you know, I barely made it through the field my second time. And at one point I was sitting there lying on the ground with my rucksack on my, like my makeup night nav. I, I think I had to retest again my yeah. second time around. And I'm sitting there in my, on my rucksack laying down in the middle of the woods in Florida. And I said to myself, you know what, this is it. I'm not even going to call in. They're just going <laughs> to come find me. I have enough food. I have enough water. I'm done. <laughs> Like I was so lost. Like I, I just yeah. I had this moment of like, I'm just going to give up. And what got you up? What got you off the, off the ground? Well, you know, I, in high school, my, my, my now wife, we, you know, we, we got, she got pregnant and uh, you know, so I had a whirlwind time around there, graduated high school in June you know, went to the boot camp in July, found out that she was pregnant around the same time, go to the sex school. There's just a lot going on in my life yeah. for an 18 year old. Sure. And the thought that we had already named him to, so was Gavin. Right. And the, as I was laying there, he crossed into my mind and I'm thinking to myself, I'm about to have a son and I don't want him to think of like, what is he going to think of me? If I tried right. something hard, my, when I first got out of high school, first got in the military and I just quit and you know I got I got emotional about it. I'm kind of getting emotional about it right now yeah and I got my ass up and I kept walking nice and you know the instructors helped me through and you know I got through that field phase and I think after the field phase uh, I started kind of going into my own and you know I eventually graduated yeah so and, and, the, and to, to make matters worse uh, this kind of back on that is around this time, my son was, was, or later on through that training, my son was born at 29 weeks. So he was, you know, almost three months premature. Wow. And I couldn't go home to see him. I couldn't afford it. And I was going to get washed back. And, you know, it was really, really a tough time. So, you know, I, I got out of there and my initial orders were to Fort Stewart. But again, Salim Trania, who was from Georgia, he had orders to Fort Riley, Kansas. And he didn't want to go to Kansas. He wanted to be closer to home. And I said, you know, I'll switch with you. Like, I'm from California. What do I care? Georgia. Right, right. It doesn't matter to me. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all not California. So that's right. And <laughs> actually, my because I knew I was having a child and my, you know, my then girlfriend, now wife, was living there. My first choice was Fort Irwin. <laughs> which nobody in the world would choose, right? Like, no, no. <laughs> They're like, great place. You, want to, you want to go there? You want to go to Barcelona? Yeah. yeah, I think they, they kind of looked at that and said, no, come on, man. Um, not We're to hook you mention that, that mission there. It's an important mission for sure. At, at National it's a Trump great Center, mission, but... just a hard location to live in. Yeah, for sure. Hard location for sure. And so again, randomly, no knowledge of anything, make this decision to swap orders. And again, it ends up being a blessing in disguise because, you know, I get to Fort Riley one of my best friends in my class gets orders there as well. And we go there together. Uh, a man named Ron LaPointe. That that was fantastic. And it was a great, great place to be stationed for a young guy as well. Like, I'm not going to lie. You know, Kansas State University is right down the road. Yeah. There's lots to do for, for young folks. Uh, you know, we had a really good time down there. And, you know, but I was only there for 18 months. Really? Yeah. Because, <laughs> again, what, I, what happened? I got sucked up into the TACP lore. And as soon as I, again, right, I, I went to Kansas, not as somewhere that I was really passionate about. Right. You know, I just helped out a buddy and here I am. Yeah. And when I got there, I started hearing more and more stories about Korea. And good or bad? Or good. Like, good. Okay. I mean, you know, good, good and bad, but mostly good. And I thought, you know, this might be a good experience to get out of the country and the training up there is fantastic as well because again you have the range yeah all over the place the whole country is you know a, a range in a sense right right so i shortly after i got to kansas i put in for orders <laughs> i put korea on my dream sheet and did I, it, 
just like Barstow, was everybody looking at you like, what? You, like they were probably questioning that decision as well. <laughs> like, they were. Yeah. I mean, you have you have a lot of folks to really love Korea. You know, yeah. like, I think I, mean, I had fun like, over there, but yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not everybody's first choice, I guess. It's not. And yeah. but I thought to myself, it's just a year at the time you, you got a uh, you got to really had a lot of say in where you chose to go afterwards, mm -hmm. right? As a follow on. Oh, right, right. So, you know, I, I just put it on there and sure enough, I got popped for orders within like a year or so of being at Fort Riley. And you know, in July of 2002, I popped over to Camp Casey, Korea. Nice. So you did a year over there. And then where, where did you want to go? What was your follow on? I noticed a lot of my friends in, in Korea started putting Fort Lewis as their follow-ons. And I started kind of looking at that, you know, at this point we finally got like, a, we had some, we had like one office computer. So the internet was available to right, us. Right. Like we can go up to the office and like hop on maybe a couple minutes a day because there's only one computer to search some stuff. Right. Right. And, and it looked intriguing to me. And a lot of my friends in Korea were going there. We actually started calling it route point Lewis. And you know, so a bunch of my friends get orders to Lewis as their follow on. I put that in as my first choice and I got Fort Lewis as well. So what I'm seeing here, and you'll see this as a pattern throughout is, you know, throughout my whole career and this to this very day exists. And this is very unique in the military as I have gone, all of my assignments have been exactly where I wanted them to be every single time. Yeah. So that's I mean, very unique. Pretty much. That, yeah. That's unheard of actually. And so I've, I've, I have nowhere to complain about where I've been stationed because I've chosen deliberately everywhere I've gone. Right. So uh, I got to Fort Lewis in 2003, you know, and I'm in the striker brigade. It's brand new. This is the first ever striker brigade stood up in, in the history of our country. Right. And our The brigade that I'm attached to is getting ready to deploy on their first striker brigade deployment that October of 2003 yep and i wasn't slotted for that because they'd already been planning for it and i afghanistan or iraq iraq okay so they literally like got the strikers over there and this is very you know this is very early after you know the invasion operations had ceased right like they're right. just trying to get you know some sense of stability and whatnot there wasn't even like id threats really at the time you know what i mean that yeah. picked up in earnest the counterinsurgency was more harassing it wasn't organized yet so it was it was a kind of a wild west type of time out there as i'm sure you know you know and yeah you know who were there and i ended up going on my first deployment in april of 2004 to iraq and it's more wild west i show up i flew commercial to kuwait like get taken by kuwaiti authorities because i have a an m4 with me it was just such a <laughs> you know i i'm up to a c-130 to get to mosul and yeah. nobody was there to pick me up <laughs> and I, hopped in, I hopped in a Hilux with the coalition provisional authority that were going to the camp that I was supposed to be at. And I just showed up at my, my at the door, like <laughs> in a combat zone, you know, 23, 22 years old and just figuring it out. It was a little loose back then. Like it wasn't uh, for some, <laughs> you know, I, I heard stories. I never actually experienced that myself, but um, yeah, it just seemed weird how they're like, yeah, just go down to Delta, get a ticket, fly to this place. And then, yeah, there was no, and I mean, I, 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 there was probably supposed to be somebody there to, to meet you, but it probably got lost in the, in everything. And it's so yeah. crazy. Yeah. So there was somebody we had, if you remember, we had a, before the invasion, we had a, a, a permanent presence essentially in Kuwait, right? Yeah. In Doha. Right. And so eventually those folks showed up at Kuwait International Airport to, to save me essentially, because they're like with Kuwaiti customs, they have my weapon out. They're passing it around because they want to like look at it and <laughs> right. firing it and i'm sitting there like trying you know to be respectful and not get I, i'm in kuwait like i don't want to be end up in no kuwaiti jail for right right you, you know what i mean like, cut off or something or yeah, who, who knows, who knows what who yeah. knows because i don't speak their language and you know i'm like i said i'm 20 22 years old right <laughs> ish Jeez. around there and just trying to figure it out uh, the Kuwaiti, the, the folks at that ASOS finally showed up and sorted me out, and then they just got me a C-130 to Mosul, and that was about it. Um, oh. <laughs> so, how was that, that? How was that deployment? Uh, I was, you know, I was fairly. I was at the brigade for most of it, so I'd say as far as like you know, 
actually being outside the wire and, and, and whatnot, it was limited. Towards the end of like the last two months of my deployment, I did a lot of, um, you know, combat escorts and supply escorts and stuff like that. We did some, some you know, border operations on the Syrian border. Right. You know, try to plug up holes as the foreign fighters were just starting to trickle in, you know, to yeah. get them right. <clears throat> but all in all, kind of uneventful. I'd say the biggest, you know, event for that deployment was my first experience of, of indirect fire attacks. Okay. And they had, where, it was a camp, Camp Courage, I think is what they called it at the time. It was Saddam's palace in Mosul. Oh, okay. Main palace. That's where the brigade headquarters was. And there was also four headquarters there as well. There's all sorts of headquarters. It's a big area. Yeah. But they, they had our, our living area zeroed in. So it was like an everyday thing. Jeez. And I remember feeling so helpless and so scared every day because... It's one thing when you're in a fight with the enemy and you both have guns and you're both kind of facing one another, right? You feel right. like you could defend yourself, mm -hmm. right? You have places to move. But in this situation, like you're, you're essentially trying to get some sleep during the day. Right. And this threat looms over you. You know, there's no, we didn't have sandbags over our, we were just in like Connex boxes, Man. shipping containers essentially. And yeah. you know, they were going through shipping containers. And young army soldiers were were being killed just where they slept. And you just never know. I mean, that's the thing about indirect. You just never know where it's going to land. I mean, and that that's fear point. that fear is paralyzing. And I remember so many times, like having to book out of the room and try to get to cover and just laying there on my face, like hoping this doesn't happen. Right. And you know, at one point, you, I, and then the scary part, I guess, is you kind of get numb to it and kind of like oh, whatever. It's my if it's my time, it's my time. Yeah. So I ended up just putting some Kevlar underneath my mattress. And when I we'd get indirect, I just kind of roll off my bed and roll under. Yeah. And hang out there and wait it out. But it's almost like you get exhausted. It's exhausting to, to be scared all the time. You know what I mean? That yes. that's kind of where that's what you're saying is like that's where that you get numb to it because you a body, a guy just can't keep being in that heightened level of fear all the time. So you're just like your body just kind of compensates for it and you, you figure out little you know, comp, you know, little techniques to get over it like you had. And yeah, it's, it's it can be exhausting for sure. And I'll, I'll say and I'll say this to you, J.D., about that experience is, you know, after that, I obviously went on to deploy many more times and was in, you know, many more direct firefights and whatnot. But that time period there, you know, sticks out to me is probably the the scariest moments in warfare that I ever had just because yeah. of that helplessness that you have inside yeah. of you. And Matter of fact, when our next brigade of strikers ripped us out, like came and replaced us in Iraq, and we had the new group of folks from the 5th Air Support Operations Squadron there to man that mission, mm -hmm. our radio maintenance, um, or one of our maintenance NCOs, uh, Master Sergeant Stephen Ackman, that's what he was killed. Oh, I just I just saw him. Somebody yeah. posted something, yeah. Yeah, so he was killed in an indirect fire attack. Like just coming back, walking back to the hooch like we all do, and was trying to get to cover, and it, you know, caused the shrapnel. Like, jeez. So it it was always looming over you. Yeah, it was tough. It was and not to mention, it was like the first time you were there. So that coupled with just the inherent fear of indirect fire, I mean, it had to be exhausting. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and that was six months of doing that. <sighs> yeah. It was a, uh, you know, but. Like you said, I think you, you we, we compensate for some of these things. Try and, to, for sure. Yeah, and, and it's one thing, I, I, and we could talk about this later. Like, I think I did a lot of mental preparation before I went to deployments mm -hmm. uh, to try to play the game in my head before I went in order to, you know, not be surprised when I see certain things. Sure. But the indirect fire attacks is not something that I prepared for before that first attack, for that first deployment. So it wasn't something that I had already kind of game planned in my head after yeah. that after that deployment i surely did <laughs> right you know on subsequent deployments but yeah yeah so yeah. All, all, all together for me you know kind of uneventful uh, besides that but i did learn a lot you know, i was at brigade i learned a lot about the mission and got some time to go roll around baghdad and uh talifar and out on the syrian border and strikers and do some stuff out there but you know nice i got back from there in uh, october of 04 and when I came to Fort Lewis, this was my first exposure to 
Rangers and special forces. Right. Right. And yeah, you got two seven five there and you got first group. So right. yeah. Yep. And as you and at the time we weren't there was no we weren't part of the 17th, what's now the 17th Special Tactics Squadron. We were still right. all part of the ASOS. So, you know, when backing up a little bit, when when 9-11 kicked off, you know, I was at Fort Riley attached to an armor unit. Mm-hmm. We knew we weren't going to get the call to go right away. Right. And, you know, as you know, and the guys that were around at that time in the SF and Ranger community, you all were the first to go along with, you know, like the 10th Mountain and some, you know, 82nd folks, right? Mm -hmm. Some some light infantry, but mostly uh, special operations folks. So when I got to Fort Lewis in 2003, this is my first exposure to these types of people. We're talking about John Knight, Chris Van. Scott Myers, Robert yep. Zachary, like Chris Mann was on the cover of a book shortly after that, you know, like <laughs> right. You know, Post, right? Uh, yep. He's there on the mountain with a beard. And, and I'm, I'm watching these guys like getting ready for deployments and grow beards and like hearing about their missions and you know, reading about them. And I'm like, these guys, wow. Yeah. <laughs> and when they walked into the building, like people just kind of looked like there they are. Yeah. It was kind of air, especially amongst us younger tactics. Sure. In the area. And, and then, so, you know, so wait a minute. So were they you guys are all under the fifth ASOS, but those guys supported Ranger slash SF. That's you right. guys and were all were, in the fifth. Yeah, but they were all they they were located on their respective compounds. So they didn't work in the fifth ASOS building. Oh, okay. But when we had they had to do all their admin there. And then when we did like commander's calls, like they had to go there. Oh yeah, yeah. They'd show up to the main squadron for those events, but right. they worked. They had their own shops over at First Group and, and Second Range of the time. Okay, gotcha. And man, so I, I realized like this is where I want to be. And then, you know, my best friend ends up coming from Korea, Earl Coble. Yep. Operation Rally Point, Fort Lewis, <laughs> and he was selected to go support First Group uh, to be a soft. Tech P is at the time what we called him, right? Mm-hmm. So he's over there. And then, like, one of my buddies from tech school, you know, at the time, senior and Chris Bauerfein gets selected to go over to first group. So, like, this is like the first guy from like my generation of, of and he was pretty young to get selected, right? As a senior. Yeah, yeah. And so now I'm thinking to myself, all right, some of these guys that I know are over there, you know, because I kind of looked at these other guys as like, man, they must, they're kind of older dudes. And like, I'm not there yet. I'm not, I don't right. have them. Experience. When I started seeing other people that I knew and were more closely um, with in, in age and rank, getting over there, I said, okay. It seemed you a know? lot more attainable at that point, I'm sure. It did. And, yeah. you know, like I said, with that kind of mystique around them and the work they were doing on deployments, I said, that's that's it. Like, that's where I want to be. Yeah. That's where I want to go. <laughs> and so, you know, by, and I didn't get over there in the conventional way. I didn't do the conventional route. Uh to get over there. So, you know, they're on a deployment, uh, the Rangers in 2005, and we had just select, they had just selected a guy and he's over there for a couple months and he gets hurt and he has to come home and they go around the fifth ASOS like, Hey, we need to replace this guy. And my NCOIC at the time in my brigade, a guy named Matt Lindmark, who kind of saw something, he knew I wanted to go that way. He kind yeah. of saw something in me. Because even, even at this time, I'm still kind of a smart ass, you know, like I'm really good at my job, but I'm also like on the fringe of maybe getting in trouble, you know? So I was kind of, he's like, but this guy, you know, he kind of, he went to bat for me. He got me my airborne slot, my pathfinder slot, you know, these types of things. And when this opportunity came up, he, he got me in. So once again, I'm randomly shipped off this time to Afghanistan. Yeah. To By way of Iraq. To really? Figure- like, and again, nobody's there really, you know, to, I, I say in Iraq, I was there met by, by Robert Zachary and, uh, Mark Lomas. Okay. But then I went off to Afghanistan. I show up at Bagram. I find my way to the compound and nobody's there to meet me. And of course, you know, I'm trying to ask, I see young, what now I now know are Rangers walking around, but you yeah. know, overseas we didn't call ourselves that. Right. right. We didn't acknowledge those things. Right. Right. So when I'm asking these young guys, like, are you guys with Charlie Company? <laughs> they just give me a dirty look and walk on. Yeah, yeah. You know like, what I mean? Who's this, like, this joke? You're trying to get intel. That's right. And 
Uh, so and you know. probably didn't have like a badge to get in or any kind of credentials to like, hey, I'm who I am and I should be here. And they're like, yeah, whatever, dude. Yeah, nothing. Yeah. And again, <laughs> like I, I, like before, I'm 23 at this time. Oh, yeah. So still very young, still trying to figure all this out. Not to mention, I'm like very nervous that I'm now among these ranks. Of right. Guys that I've been trying to join. And now it's time to like, you know, you're there. So you got to perform. Yeah. Yeah. And that deployment, I, I soon found out, was pretty boring for everybody. You know, Af Afghanistan at the time, uh, people, you know, a lot of folks forget that there was a time period there, you know, between, you know, after the tour of war and kind of things settled down and that you know, chase for bin Laden and whatnot, and the Taliban got pushed over into Pakistan. There was a long period there, you know, maybe five or six years where there wasn't a whole lot going on in yeah. Afghanistan. And very, scrapes happening. are very few and far between. And yeah, there was a whole, you yeah, know, there wasn't a whole lot of, there was, there were things going on, but it was really kind of low key and not very, you know, it was, e e I want to, I throw the word easy around, but essentially it was easy compared to what those guys had to do, you know, during Anaconda and that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. Subsequent so, years. Yeah. Go ahead. Exactly. I think this is the, you know, I, I look back now in, at the time, this is the time like really when the Taliban it was, you know, rebuilding you know they're they're refitting and, and getting strength <laughs> in, in Pakistan and trying to build that up right and yep so I show up there and I, I link up with um third platoon Charlie company second ranger battalion and they haven't really been doing anything for months yeah they've been on like one little mission or two they're doing a lot of training and and, and pe for people who don't know Rangers they're geared to go out and fight right they want to go out and fight that's what makes them so great. Like as a force, if you want someone to go out there in mass and be lethal and and take something, that's why they're the you know, the world's premier raid force and direct. Right. I mean, they want to get at it. And when they're yep. they're cooped up in Bagram, you know, yeah, going to raging and doing shoot houses, crazy, yeah. they're getting stir crazy. It's it's that's not a happy happy place for those folks. And they're all right. chomping at the bit because their buddies in Iraq, which was popping off at the time, mm -hmm. are doing all this work. Yeah. Right. So Iraq was the place to be. Afghanistan was kind of the, you know, the, the side, like the platoons who got Afghanistan at the time were like, oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> another, another, you know, a few months, another few months of Bagram or wherever, not doing a whole lot. Um, yep. But I got there and we did start doing a little bit of work. We got a mission. Um, there was a, you know, down at Fobskin, are you familiar with Fobskin out there? Oh, East? yeah. I've done a lot of time skin. We so, stood that place up. Outpost, right? It's like this little oh. shit outpost. You're still pissing yeah. in mortar tubes out there in 2005, right? And Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's right near the pack border. And what was happening at the time is these, you know, Al-Qaeda Taliban folks are just walking right over the border. You know, pack mill, pack military border patrols saluting them on their way through. Have a good one, but yeah, exactly. And they're just attacking american forces on this on this fire base mm -hmm. and there was an incident i don't remember quite what happened but there i think you know either a helicopter got hit and there was some loss of life or it was just damaged mm -hmm. so they decided to send us out there my platoon and we link up with rd so this is when i first meet eric brandenburg <laughs> oh, okay who is also an intimidating fellow when you're, you know, a young 23 year old and you see this, you know, bearded <laughs> big dude, you know, right. <laughs> muscular, big wise. Yeah. yeah. Oh, those other big, tall and yeah, just... bearded guys. And, you know, hey, I'm the tack P. Um, and I'm still that goofy, you know, I mean, I was like kind of goofy, but like <laughs> yeah. good at my job, but goofy. Like, hey, what's For up? Sure. The tack P guy? Yeah. Yeah. Very laid um, back. Very, that, yeah. Very, I'm, yeah. Here, I'm here with the, Free Charlie. I just got here a couple weeks ago. I'm ready to, ready to roll. And he's like, yeah, all right. Well, he's kind of filling me out. And again, I'm thrown into an almost impossible situation for a young guy because the we're there with uh, a SEAL team. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say it's the, I'll just say it for the sake of this podcast, it's the varsity swim team um, at a damn night. Right. Yeah. And uh, that's what Earl and I would call them, the varsity swim team. <laughs> Right. So again, we're talking about some of the most elite fighters in the whole world. Mm -hmm. Older guys, typically, because as SEALs do, you know, they got to kind of go through, you know, that process, and they're typically, you know, E7s, E8s, E9s, right? Right. 
Well, their their JTAC was a combat controller. He had to go home for emergency leave or something. Yeah. They needed a JTAC. They throw me in. <laughs> so I'm there with a bunch of young Ranger guys I linked up with. I, I, I identify more at the time with like the privates and the specialists because we're all sure. the same. I hadn't learned at the time like that as a JTAC, you're a key leader in you know the the platoon, right? Yeah. You're, you're key to that fire support team. Oh, I didn't yeah. know at the time. I just kind of got in because I showed up halfway through or more than halfway through and just kind of got in with people my own age who kind of had similar interests. Right, right. And they're like, you need to get out of our hooch and go move into that hut with those guys. <laughs> so, With the pack- Navy guys? Yeah, the Navy guys. So I, I pack up my stuff <laughs> and I roll in there and with guys who, you know, are just, they're so on top of it and they're yeah. so impressive in what they do. And, you know, I'm frankly very nervous and like I'm questioning everything I do because these guys, they, they know it all. So I'm moving with this team of SEALs and our pet monkey street they had a pet monkey yeah and and I, i've talked to eric brandenburg about this afterwards and he kind of gave me a lot of and this is like this is just like a couple months ago that i talked yeah. to eric and he gave me a lot of reassurance that i had no clue of at the time but you know i guess i used my personality at the time to, to kind of fit in with these guys sure make them laugh a little bit yeah, I mean, if you if you exude that confidence, it, it puts them at ease. Like if you come in, they're all nervous and, uh, hey, I'm um, the JTAC. What should I be doing? You know, they, then they're like, oh, who's this guy? But you, knowing you, and I know you very well, I could see how they would be, they would just take to you immediately. You know, I mean, you kind of put everybody at ease. Like, okay, this guy's all right. Even if whatever his military background is, he's just a guy that gets it. You know, you're you're a cool dude to talk to. You're a cool guy to hang out with. So, yeah, that would that would make them comfortable with, you know bring you into their tight circle. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Very tight circle. And, and yeah. And so it's just a comedy of errors, really. Like we, we end up going on this mission. What it ends up being is like uh, we set up, you know, reconnaissance points and then we're trying to trying to figure out where these guys are crossing the border. And then we're going to set up ambushes, right. For these, these guys crossing the border. Yep. And so we're doing recon like all day, hide side covered up, I'm like doing essentially the R, the Ranger reconnaissance mission, but with, with the steel team, never really done this before. Like this is, I haven't had any training on this, Yeah, but I, I know how to work aircraft and stuff. So I did my part in that and to make matters worse. I developed before we went on the mission, like a day before I developed bronchitis. Oh no. So I have to cough. <laughs> it's just not a good quality to have <laughs> when, you're, when you're doing reconnaissance on the Pakistan border. Like, you no. don't want to be coughing. Like, I gotta be quiet. Yeah. I was just miserable. Oh. Like, coughing into my shirt, like, <laughs> like trying to. Just miserable. Yeah. And we had a doc with us, so he was at least giving me some meds on this reconnaissance. And yeah, we just nothing. It was. It ended up being uneventful after yeah. all said and done, but. It was a great experience. I'm rucking around the mountains with these guys. Like these guys were moving out. We'll get to this later. I just was not prepared physically for this deployment either. Like I was no. really struggling. Really struggling. Well, I mean, in your defense, you came, you were like in the fifth, and then you just got thrown into the Rangers and then thrown into, you know, the varsity seals. So it's like it, and no hit on, and we kind of touch on this, and it really is, and I was the same way because at a conventional unit, it it, it really is on you to try to and we had a lot of like my first assignment was great. I had a lot of good mentors, you know, like Eric Harris and Keith Ingram and Jimmy Felton. Um, but then it, after I left there, you know, it's kind of easy to get into that tag P kind of uh, it, you go down two different paths. You can either go down the path of I'm going to hone my skills and be really great at it. Or you can kind of skate if you want to. And it's kind of on the individual. And I'm not saying that that's what you did, but I could see I how. But I, you know what I mean? Like, like, you know, yeah, you don't know that what level you're supposed to be at unless, you know, until you get in that situation and then you're like, go ahead. I took the I, approach where I was going to hone my skills and be the best JTAC possible. Like I had all the confidence in the world in the range, but I didn't want to do all the physical work for the Ranger right, right. SF side. Like yeah. I was still very much in young guy mode, you know, a lot of partying. I wasn't taking care of my nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and when and that it's easy nutrition- to do that. Yeah, for sure. So I could see and how. I, and I was still go. good enough to pass, you know, whatever Air Force. For sure. Uh, sure. Had yeah. Me, right. Like, <laughs> right. And I can still do a flat ruck march around the airfield, like right, that kind of stuff. Yep, but exactly, you know, humping around 
you know, really heavy packs because you're out there on reconnaissance yeah. over the mountains and, and on the pack border is not ready for that. So I, I was struggling to keep up and we, we finish up this mission and we go back to Bagram and we're packing up and we are getting ready to roll out and we're going out to the range to do like a mortar shoot just to do some training before we head back. And all of a sudden the Humvees skid out, do a U-turn and head back to Bagram. And that's when we got notified that we were being activated to go for the Lone Survivor Rescue in Operation Red Wings. And that's where I started that involvement in that mission set. Yeah. And this is like, like I said, you know, we were supposed to be leaving, ripping out. And like, no, you guys got to go. There's, they started briefing us on this. There was, you know, four SEALs. We don't know what their status is. They, they were under attack. They called for backup. Quick reactive force helicopter shot down. You know, now we need more people to go out there and figure this out, right? It wasn't the the QRF was shot down. You know, that was the initial reaction force. Now everybody's getting real serious. Everybody's yeah, getting serious, right. So not I'm not trained or prepared for this at all. Uh, again, I'm you know doing the best with what I can do. And and here's here's a great story when we're talking about um, Brian G. Yeah, yeah. right. Uh, He's the first sergeant at the time of Seco, of Charlie Company, yeah. 275. And, you know, we get, we get, we ended up getting there like, when Eric and those guys and some like Chris Domey, I believe, was out there on that walk as well. Mm -hmm. And those guys started doing that crazy walk that they had to do to try to get to the crash site. Amazing. That was about, I think, 24 hours or so before we ended up Marine 48 maybe launching to go to go out there. We ended up having you, to wait. Were you guys just waiting for them to see what they were going to be doing or like what no. was the... We what were trying to go. We were trying to go immediately. Um, once they decided to send us, and we got, we started spinning. So they gave us a little bit of time for planning. And all the time, you know, Eric and those guys are walking, right? Right. We're doing our planning, and we're supposed to rope in, you know, whatever night it's like the 29th or 28th, something like that, 29th or 30th of June. And we we get up, and I think we even got up in the helicopter. Anyway, they call it off because the weather was bad. The gunship okay. couldn't see the the rope sights. And everybody's very, you know, you know, kind of on edge because remember, a, a, a Chinook just got shot down, and we lost. Yeah, 18, I think it was eighteen. Oh uh, yeah, there's just American. a whole like a whole a whole squad of guys or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The seals and then the the the, the, the one sixty operators who are on the on the on the helicopter. Yeah. yeah. So that was a big concern, but the funny thing, so we ended up going in the next night and we're launching. But before that, I figure out we're fast roping. Had you done I've never before? fast roped before. <laughs> Gosh darn it. I, I showed up. I didn't do a training cycle. We don't oh. we didn't fast rope at the strike. I can't imagine I, what like it's just one thing after another of like new things that you have to just you just have to do. Like the, there was no time to like say, Well, I've never done this, guys. They're like, no, you, you just had to you have to do that stuff. That's right. And so they had a small little fast rope setup on Bagram, like a little tower. Yeah, it wasn't really really a tower. It was like on the side of one of the like huts, essentially. Right. So it didn't really. It wasn't a mock up of a, a sixty or a forty seven, which I ended up fast roping out. It was a Chinook, which you know and others know is a little bit sporty because the rope is kind of off the ramp, so you have yeah. to kind of reach to grab it and then kind of put yourself out. Yep. So I, I we're done with the planning. They have kind of slapped the table on doing this this fast rope, and I quietly walk over to to Brian G. <laughs> after I kind of tap him on the shoulder all meekly, he's a crusty ranger, man. He's oh, I know. I was with him in ACO 375. He was a you know, platoon right? sergeant there. Oh, yeah. He Great guy. In, he, awesome he jumped guy. into Afghanistan, like on a, yeah. a yeah. runner. Like he's just, he's kind of this, you know, air about him, right? Sure. Um, the type Great of guy, guy you'd see probably just walking around the battlefield with bolts flying around him. He's just calm, like, <laughs> right. like that, that someone from like Black Hawk Down, you know, like, yeah, uh, yeah. that colonel in that movie. Like, so. I walk up and I'm like, hey, first sergeant, I, I've never fast rope before. <laughs> so he he looks at the first ranger and he goes, hey, take him over to that the little mock up, put him down the rope a few times. And I go, okay. And as he's walking away, I was like, hey, first sergeant, what about off the helicopter? Like, what about when we go out there at night? And he just looks at me and he goes, hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and I relayed the story right. to him. I relayed the story to him on Facebook last year. 
he posted something for Red Wings, and I I put that quote like on the Facebook comments. Like <laughs> my favorite, you know, first Sergeant D quote at the time was, "Hold on," and <laughs> so that's what I did. That's basically what it is, though. I mean, I held on. I held on, and we we fast roped in and walked, and we ended up uh, getting to the crash site um, to start securing it. And yeah, how that- far offset did you rope into from the crash site? I, be- I believe it was like three three kilometers. Okay, three and a half kilometers, three to five. You know, it wasn't it wasn't anything crazy. It just you know it was on a ridge line, so it was a little sporty. Yeah, and as we had a whole bunch of helicopters coming in, and the last guys who fast roped ended up going down like a ninety foot rope. Right. Like we were like at 25, but for some reason, like they kept going up and this poor PJ guy thought he was going on a 25 foot rope and decided to just go with like his, his tactical gloves. Oh, he went down like a 90 foot rope and like we had to evac him out the next day is really his hands were uh mush. And the guy, the guy you want to treat everybody else had to get treated. Darn it. That sucks. Yeah. You know, it's one of those things. Cause we we're, we thought we were only going to be out there like 12 hours or so we didn't really have any sense of how long this mission was going to take. You know, you try to, when you're operating at those altitudes and, and at that, you know, in the mountains, you try to cut down every excess thing. You oh, can. for sure. Um, yeah. It's hard enough just walking, let alone carrying a bunch of weight and, you know, and yeah, I listened to sure. Brandy's episode that you guys have with him. I think he mentioned, you know, dropping back plates and stuff like that. Like, or we'd, we'd yeah. drop plates too. Yeah. I don't, I don't even think they were wearing armor. I think yeah, we, we dropped because, I mean, it's a lot. It's a lot to I, do. I mean, I tell you what, when I, when I was with Recky and we walked through the mountains, we never wore armor up there. I mean, we we just went with what we had. I mean, it's just too. Yeah. You you have to sacrifice the uh, the speed and agility for the safety of a, of a of plates. You know what I mean? If you go out there and just smoke yourself wearing armor, then you're no good if you get into a fight or whatever. So That's you kind of right. have to weigh it. You know. So and we saw that later on when you know after we'd done you know. Marcus Latrell had been recovered, and once we had gotten, you know, Deets and Murphy recovered their, their remains, you know, we had some conventional troops coming from the 82nd and some Marines, and they were, you know, their rules are their rules. Like, they were straight up, armored up all the way down to the the, the nut plate down there, like, yeah. shoulder pads, like, everything. And those Jeez. guys were falling, I mean, it was, they were struggling, man. They were falling out left and right, because yeah, it was warm during the day, and it's mountainous, and you're at out, it's just not a good good condition but so yeah it's a bad we got maybe. there we uh secured the crash site and you know that's when everybody started kind of linking up there and brian g started kind of taking control of that area and, and getting lz's going and trying to get the remains of the folks in the crash set up yeah. there and get them recovered identified recovered and got it get out of there right so for our platoon we split in half essentially and we sent like half of our guys to go down at this point, we're starting to get the, in, the Intel about Latrell. Mm-hmm. And then they go down to do that. And my, my team, part of my platoon went to the original site of the, the fight that they were in the Latrell and the, and the team there. Yeah. We try to figure out if there's anybody surviving it over there or, and to pick up remains to, to try to right. identify them and find them. So that's where I was at. Um, when we first got to that location, you know, we, we went down the, the ridge line and I don't know how those guys like what I will say, like the movie, I've seen the movie yeah. and I will say like the terrain that they show them, like when they're trying to egress back and fight down that mountain and it's very steep and they're kind of tumbling down it. Yeah. That's yeah. No joke. Like that yeah. terrain was that steep and they're trying to fight down that through an, over, you know, with an overwhelming force above them. Yeah. So that, that, that was my first sense of it. You know, I mean, there were shell casings everywhere. Um, I mean, whatever anybody wants to say about those four guys, whatever, whatever led up to it, whatever happened after, whatever happened during, it's indisputable that they were in a tough situation. And I don't think people understand the gravity of, I think that, like you said, the movie kind of portrays a, a, in some way, but nobody can imagine, like, it's one thing just to fight on flat ground, but like, if you're on a steep and it's loose rock and you know, you got a lot of times climbing up those hills, we would use, we had to get on our hands and knees to climb up. So I did climbing back up. I crawled, I had all my, all my, rucksack and all my tack piece stuff in there i had i started to carry all the batteries and comms equipment so I was, sure I was sure struggling. i was struggling real hard yeah and, and, and you I imagine was, like trying to evade and like maneuver on bad guys i mean it's just uh those, i can't imagine what those guys are going through it's it was terrible. a horrible situation and yeah. you know and, and i started thinking about it like man i was just in this situation like i didn't get in a fight but i was just doing a recce somewhere else in the country i could have been you very, you could have could have very easily been you yeah 
And we had goat herders come up onto us as well while I was on that mission, like just like happened to these guys. Yeah. And we luckily we had a an Afghan special operator guy uh, who was named Blackbeard. Right. <laughs> he fought against the Soviets. He's just a guy who likes to fight people like yeah. some of them are, and he walk around the mountains with no shoes on. Crazy dude. But the goat herders we saw, he just popped out of our hide site. And we're trying to yell him like, get back, get back, get back. It was our cousins or something like that. So we kind of put the fear of Blackbeard in them. Yeah. <laughs> and who knows? That might have that might have been our saving grace. Yeah. You know, Blackbeard knew, knew a dude. Yeah. Um, they could have been there to kill you. And he's like, no. I'm yeah, they could have gone back and reported to Pack Mill. And then they could have organized an ambush on us. Uh, but Blackbeard went out there and, and talked to these guys, even though we tried to stop them. You know, and the, and the guys on Red Wing, Latrell and those guys, they didn't have anybody up there. It was just four. Nope. They didn't have any Terps. We had a Terp. They didn't have any, you know, local indigenous folks. So right. they're out there flapping. And yeah, it was tough. But when we got down there, uh, started going down that hill, the first day uh, we found Dietz. We found the remains of, of, of Dietz. And uh, that was my first time seeing, you know, a dead body, essentially. Yeah. And, and it was American. I was going to say it'd be even worse because it was an American. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was a, a really, you know, it's one of those things that you'll, you'll never, ever forget. Um, you know, and, and not for a good reason, but right. Uh, you know, in, in some way, I, 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 you know, I was I was glad that we we had found him and that we were able to start. We had PJs with us, and they were going to start, you know, packaging these guys up so they can get extract and get back to their families, which yep. you know, I thought was fantastic. And and the, and the fact that we would do that after all these helicopters, were sh this helicopter shot down, all this stuff, and we're still going to put a bunch of folks out there, get a bunch of assets in the air to, to get these guys out so they can get back home. It's just a testament to Americans are resolved to bring everybody back. Right. It's, it's fantastic. And so we did that. It was a couple of days later, you know, we, we found uh, Murphy's remains and got him extracted. And during this time period, you know, we, they had identified, you know, positions or enemy positions or potential positions on the other ridge line. And that's when I got my first like real action, I guess, in combat as far as controlling goes. Okay. That you need a you need to set up some some fire missions, some some close air support on these targets. We're gonna pass you targets. You got a gunship and an eight and a set of A10s, like do what you will. Nice. And so I that was awesome because they they empowered me, they trusted me, and I was out there with just you know, half a ranger platoon as a senior airman and yeah. I'm coordinating when I ended up doing a type three control. Right. Because, like, it's a, you know, it's one of those clear geographic barriers, like go to, go to town over there. <laughs> right. We're not there. Whatever's over there is not us. So go for yeah, it. Yeah. And, and it was, it was such a, a weird mission. Like it was cold up there. It was night. And I, I kind of like just popped up in my sleeping bag, essentially <laughs> with my Islid. Right passing stuff over the radio and just kind of pointing things <laughs> uh and it, it was it, so I, I got to see like my first you know use of fire support that i yeah. you know, planned and, and so that was a very formative moment for me nice. and what was otherwise a very you know trying uh, no sleep i was the only one with like satcom so i was the connection for everybody I had a one mic in, i'm sure you had a headset or a mic in your the whole time just listening yeah i got i got transmuting it. I got like goofy at one point, like even goofier than I already was. And there's a, a ranger, his name's Chip Allen. And he kind of approached me one day after like three days of this. And he's like, Hey man, like, what do I need to listen for? What are some of the key terms that I need to listen to on this radio? Because you're not into it. Yeah. And like, he's trying was, to take over for you, man. It was great. Like, it's one of those things like in time, you're like, yeah, man, I got it. Or yeah, thanks, brother. But like now looking back, like that's what it's about, like taking care of one another. He was willing to step out of his comfort zone. He's he's doing a lot of work himself. He's walking up and down mountains. Yeah. And he realizes that I'm the only one that's comms equipment and I've been I haven't been sleeping. And uh, he he took the headset from me for a few hours to let me get some some, some sleep. sleep. Nice. So, it was fantastic. It was, it was just guys taking care of each other. There's a lot of there was, for sure. it was cold and rainy. We're spooning. Right, like, <laughs> right, right. Like, they, we didn't have any sleeping bags or anything like that because we thought we were only going to be out there, you know, a very short period of time. So they airdrop sleeping bags, and I get one. A combat controller comes up that day to meet us. He doesn't have anything except a space blanket. Yeah, and 
I, I tell everybody the story. It's great. Like <laughs> middle of the night, three in the morning, I hear, hey, 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 T. Shivering teeth. Do you have any room in that sleeping bag? <laughs> and I, I just remember going, Zzz, and going, hop in, cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> And he got in my sleeping bag. Like he was out there. It was it sucked. It was a yeah. crappy situation. And, but you know, he was cold. And yeah. That's what you do. You, you well, and and people don't realize that. I think that's one of those things that like isn't well known, but it's not that is not unheard of. That's a that's a pretty common thing because number one, body heat is a big deal. And uh and yeah. helping your buddy out, you know, if you're you know, you don't it's not something that especially Ranger, you know, got a bunch of guys over here or who are in a good situation and they would never leave one guy over there just sucking, you know, they'd be like, yeah, right, get over here. Let's figure this help that's this right. guy out. So yeah. That's... And that happened throughout like my platoon sergeant. We didn't have any, I, I was the only one who happened to bring a poncho. I, I brought a poncho. I always brought a poncho. Nice. Yeah. I, we're in, we're up at like 10,000, whatever it is feet. And then a hailstorm comes through. Oh man. It's disgusting, cold and, and wet. And uh, my platoon sergeants guys had built these little huts, but the platoon sergeant is doing a lot of walking around. Right. You're like, Ray Fuller, his name, and he can't, you know, he can't be taking time to build his little bivouac site, you know, like everybody else was, because he's doing all his leadership roles and right, right. You know, underneath the poncho with me, like he was freezing and shivering. Like you gotta, you gotta help each other out. Um, so yeah, it, it it was a lot of suck, but you know, a lot of and learning. That's, you know, like you said, that's a testament to the that unit or it, just Americans in general that it does it did suck, and you know. But we, you, it didn't matter that it sucked because you were going out to do what you needed to do to get those guys back. I mean, that's, I mean, re, regardless, I mean, Brandy had his long walk. You know, Chaz Bocook was out there doing his thing. You're out there. Everybody was just having a hard time, but you kind of put it in the back of your mind because you, there are things to do. So, I mean, yeah, it's, you can acknowledge that it sucks, but you never quit. Kind of going back to like you sitting out there in Florida, you know, um, you know, you had you, you. There's always a reason why you, you get up and keep moving. Yeah, so that's right. Yeah, absolutely. And and they saw. You know, they, we the leadership saw that I was struggling carrying that weight. Like I said, I was not. I was not physically prepared for that deployment. And so walking up and down that hill, you know, Sergeant Fuller like kind of saw that and smartly knowing that I had the comms equipment kept me kind of at the high point. You know, one because he saw I was struggling. And two, because that's the best place for have you know to have comms and, and to sure. kind of fill that role as well. And he saw that, and so you know it allowed me to stay up there. But you know, it's just those little things at the time. I thought at the time I thought like they were thinking this guy's weak. Keep him up the top of the hill, like he's excess baggage. Mm -hmm. And there, that might have been a little bit of it. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I think looking well, back. Now, it, maybe it makes, a, maybe a, a little bit, but more like uh, this just makes tactical sense to keep him up there, you know, like not does. so much like look at this, you know. But the mission is always first, so you know. Right. Yeah. But I got my I got my positive reinforcement when we got back from that deployment, and remember at this time I'm not an officially selected Ranger Tac P. I just was an augmentee essentially. Right. And um, but you know I I guess I'd say I passed my tryout, and <sighs> for sure the the Rangers. Ended up being, you know, the guys in, in Charlie Company, our fire support officer, and 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 Brian G. They ended up being my biggest advocates, and 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 telling the leadership over there, like, hey, we want this guy, and and, and writing letters of recommendation for my selection package because at nice. the time we didn't we didn't do the, you know, it wasn't as a it wasn't a tryout like it is today, you know, right, right, the way they do it now, very more very sophisticated, and yep, uh, you know, you did kind of like a local tryout and then put in your package. And kind of got vetted right. by the guys locally. Yeah, he did a PT test and he did like some other stuff and you, uh, you yeah. got vetted or whatever. Um, but like, I mean, but that's a testament to you, man. I mean, that's that, that the, and I think that could, whoever's listening, you know, it may, it may help them out if they're ever on the fence of whether or not they want to keep going or quit or whatever. I mean, it, it does, it does speak or it does help immensely if you just keep going, you know, just take another step, just keep it going, just take it easy you know, kind of curb that, that feeling of feeling sorry for yourself. I mean, it really, it's really easy to just kind of go down that path and be like, well, I'm sucking and I'm justified for, you know, not for, I'm justified for quitting because it sucks and I feel, I feel bad for me or whatever, but um, it also, it's exponentially better. I think the other way, when you don't quit, when you do stop feeling sorry for yourself and just keep going for sure. I yeah. mean, obviously it did for you, it paid dividends for you. 
especially when it's a, I, I'd, I'd caveat that, especially when it more, more when it's like a physical type of, of pain, like you're struggling mm-hmm. with, as far as like warfare goes, I, I do believe there's a distinction between like the mental fatigue side of it. Like for sure, not, not just being tired, but like when you're having mental health problems, yeah. yeah. Like that's probably time that you need to, and we all struggle with this. this I think it's why they're exasperated by a lot of folks is we don't stop. Yeah. We have that. Mentality. That's a good point. Yeah. The mental health side. Uh, but you're right. Like physically, you know, you can push through a lot more and you're capable of a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. Even like a guy in my situation at that time who was admittedly out of shape, not prepared <laughs> and was thrust into the situation. Uh, you know, we, we made it work and, you know, we came back and, you know, I didn't know the time, obviously, like I said, I'm so young. I didn't know the gravity of this mission or that it'd become a, you know, Mark, Mark and the Funky Bunch would be creating a film about, right. you know, become a book and and whatnot. But it's something now that it's like a, a you know, some people always want to talk about it. They want to ask about what happened out there. They're interested, like, you know, was it real? Was it, what, what was this fat? And, you know, yeah. so, uh, so that's, that was the start of my, uh, my Ranger Tag P career. Nice. Uh, which I, I continued to do through uh, like August, I think, of 2009 before I started thinking about commissioning. But um, before we get to so, there, I was going to say, yeah, there was some battalion recce time in there, I think, isn't there? Yeah, there was, but I didn't, you know, I didn't deploy. So they, they had kind of stopped deploying the battalion recce like they had in 2005 and 2006. Okay. They were actually, you know, doing a lot more close target reconnaissance type stuff like they, they kind of stopped doing that mission around 2007 2008 so we were kind of farmed out okay like the recce platoon a lot of folks were kind of farmed out you know like the snipers the the like you know electronic guys and yeah, yeah. so I, I ended up so yeah i trained up with the recce platoon but i ended up going to you know regular rifle platoon for the deployment. okay but before that in you know 2000 six or 2007 uh I, I i thought it'd be great to bring it up for this day because it, it happened this battle happened on veterans day oh for sure yeah so veterans we, hill you're yep, veterans hill yeah, yeah. which for those who were there and it pops up on linkedin it pops up everywhere around this time of year like the folks that were there on veterans hill this you know otherwise pretty much unheard of battle goes down and it's been used as a you know a leadership tool for for army officers to figure out like what would you do here so it has been used as a situation to try to teach people certain things and i'll set it up by, by saying this is a, a a green on blue incident but not in the the afghan sense where you know some insider guy takes some shots at you know guys on base and kills them it wasn't like that right um we were going to do a, a direct action mission against a, a target like we always do Right. This, we had a, a high value target that was located at a, a house and we were going to go to that house at night and, and and snatch them up. Right. So we offset infill, you know, whatever it is, three, five kilometers. And we start walking to down the road. There's actually a big highway, which is, you know, not something we're used to. I was with the 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 Hilo assault force out of Balad. So we were in a lot of rural areas. We weren't used to being around major highways. Yeah. Yeah. We get a call from the ISR that, hey, there's a, a, a conventional convoy about two kilometers up. It's coming south. We want to avoid this convoy because this is how you can get, you know, mistaken for the wrong individuals. Right, right. And we see a, a nice hilltop out there in, a, in Iraq. You know, in the middle of the desert, there's this nice OP looking type position. So we decide we're going to walk around and kind of hunker down behind that terrain feature let the convoy pass and then get back on our way. Okay. The ISR picks us all out and we have the best intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance forces in the world. Right. Right. When you're, when you're talking about supporting the Rangers as well and the task force, like even better, like we have yeah. the best. The, yeah. Whatever's that, whatever the best is out there, you're getting it for sure. And somehow they missed this Iraqi company a base that was there so we're starting to come around scoot get closer and closer to this this um this hilltop it's on the like we'll say from where i'm walking on the right side of the road when all of a sudden hell starts coming down at us 
automatic weapons, RPGs, and we're just a ranger platoon on flat ground. Oh like, man, there's nowhere to hide. And oh, like where are we? What are we gonna do? Where are we gonna go? And we're all laying flat. You know, they got the rangers up front start returning fire like they do. They brought up a. The Carl Gustav, which for those listening or, or watching that don't know, it's a shoulder fire weapon that can be anti, you know, personnel or anti, you know, armor, or, you know, that type of thing. Similar to like a recoilless rifle or something. Yeah. And we're we're doing whatever we can and trying to figure out what is going on. Like, what is happening here? And while this is going on, I'm there with Chad Jenkins, who's the platoon leader. And then uh, the platoon sergeant at the time was uh, a guy named Mike Burke. And... Uh, we're yelling at each other trying to figure this out and while this is happening i hear from the other side of the road this loud report you know like of a like artillery or something firing and then i see this giant round come over the road and impact around us and i'm like what the f- was that <laughs> i get on the radio and the isr is like hey there's like a tank company over there oh my god and they're starting to move and that those rounds are coming from the main guns of those tanks jesus and that's when i like yelled out to you know the leadership that i'm around because it's the jtac I'm, I'm there with the cp you know like the leadership team and i'm like they got tanks <laughs> <laughs> you know, i know how to say um they got tanks and they're, they're starting to uncoil and to you know maneuver onto us while we're in this now at this point were were they did you think they were in like enemy tanks like were they enemy tanks or like I, I didn't mean to cut you off but it just no this is 2006 or i think i think 2006 or 2007 so we're well beyond the you know invasion yeah so there's exactly right these are now our our friends oh right that's why i say it's green on blue and yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know to be fair to them they're up there on this hilltop and they see a bunch of folks sneaking up on them at night you know they don't they didn't know we were coming yeah and they reacted how they thought they had to do. So I, I don't sure. really blame them for that reaction. You know, they're they're on edge too, right? They're of getting course. attacked by yeah. Al Qaeda, and at the time as well. Yep. So now we're in the situation where we're getting shot at by tanks. We got full on fire coming down from on top of a, a elevated position, and we're flat laying in the desert. Jeez. And yeah, you know, I'm I'm worried. I, I'm lot I'm scared. Like, what are we gonna do? So I, I start yelling at. Chad Jenkins, like, let me drop a bomb. Just let me drop a bomb. Uh, because I think, you know, at this point, I'm thinking, let's save our Rangers. Like, and it might sound bad to people who are out there listening or who don't understand warfare, but I'll, I'll, at the time, I would have trade in any of the Iraqis on that OP for any of the Americans down on the desert floor. Right. And at that point, you didn't know, did you know they were friendly up, up on the top or i mean you didn't know i did that, once we once i figured out that there was tanks in like a, a little patrol base like it was a base over there oh okay. like we had no idea it was there it was that was so weird about the whole thing it's like our isr is the best and somehow this slipped we didn't we walked right into it yeah and so i knew they were i knew they were friendly but like i said we're in this situation that seems like we can't get out of it and right there's nowhere to run essentially and i i don't i don't want anybody in our side americans to get to get killed in this so for sure but 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 chad jenkins had the wherewithal with all this stuff going on we're talking over explosions and bullets flying over our heads and and he said he yelled something to me to the effect of like i'm not gonna kill americans and it clicked on me is that time when we had these iraqi forces out there we typically had a whole group of american advisors that would go out there with them right you know so oh there's more to this picture than just us right like he was thinking about is there americans up there are we yeah. on a, a blue on blue is this a fra- you know is this the case of fratricide about to happen and so we're, we're lost and i'm like let's let's do a show of force so i bring in the f-16s they come right across i think if they think that there's aircraft on station that it's got to be for these guys and not for us. We didn't request anything. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, they get too low and their flares automatically pop out of the F-16, illuminating our position on the desert floor. Oh, my God. <laughs> and the fire just gets more intense and concentrated. So we're like, no, no more flares. Like, stop. <laughs> stop. 
um, the situation is just getting worse. And now the tanks are really starting to come out and, 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 you know, trying to create like a flanking maneuver on us. Yeah. So we finally decide, you know, we got to run. Like, we just got to get out of here. And we're, we're all the time I'm talking to the helicopters, trying to get like an LZ set up somewhere that the Chinooks can come and pick us up. Yeah. We can run to. And then they identified a little berm. So we all start running. And it's like full on, full run. Everybody's a dead sprint. Yeah. Uh, the whole range of platoon. And we get down there. And this part, we can start seeing the tanks coming up on our left-hand side. Like, they're there now. We can see them. And, and some Humvees and stuff. We're still getting shot at. And we're waiting on and still trying to coordinate the extract, the exfil. We're like, how are we going to stop these tanks? Like, we need to stop these tanks before they come in. It'll be like shooting fish in a barrel. Yeah. And we don't know what to do. We had Apaches on from the Mississippi National Guard. And they went and shine some white lights on them it wasn't stopping anything like they weren't getting the hint that like these helicopters and f-16s weren't there for them and were these american tanks i don't i'm not sure to this day i don't know but I, i'd imagine oh, okay. they weren't they were they're they're iraqi tanks okay they, they weren't m1s okay um so we're sitting there and you know to this day we're we we all kind of hazy i think we how are we going to stop this? We ended up saying to the, the Apaches, like, will you land on the road or in the desert in front of these tanks so we can run to our exfil point? And these guys in the Mission National Mississippi National Guard said, sure thing, man. And so man, that could have went oh, how how brave are those guys? I mean, how uh, helpful. <laughs> the Humvee, Frankly. so there's a Humvee out in the lead. I remember this because I I'm watching them as they're starting to land and there's a Humvee out in a lead and there's some tanks out there and they start to land and Iraqis start dismounting with their AKs and they're running up to the helicopter and they look like frantic, like they're mad that the helicopter's there. Like they're in our way. Every time they get close to the helicopter, the Apaches would lift up a little bit to create that rotor wash Yeah, and it blow them back. <laughs> and <laughs> the Apaches blocked those vehicles and those tanks and allowed us to run and the chinooks came in real quick picked us up and we were out of there oh my god the amazing were they, thing, um were they creating any kind of brownout like did that help at all or was it just uh just the just the rotor wash blowing the guys back it was a little bit a little bit of both like so oh. they were at, at this point they got to the road so you know it was more of the rotor wash blowing physically blowing the the iraqi soldiers back as they had their ak's out like kind of pointing Jeez. at these guys, you know, at the Apaches. And we got out of there. And the amazing you guys thing. you take any casualties or anything? Or? Zero. Man. It is an amazing. Oh, my God. And even on the other side, we come to find out later that, you know, they're in a fortified position up there. But on the Iraqi side, you know, the Carl Gustav round, like, blew off a guy's hand uh, on the Iraqi yeah. side. But that was it. And so That's not, that's side, not too bad. I mean, it sucks, but. At least the guy is still alive, you know. That's right. So there was no casualties, really, and no casualties oh on our God. side. It, it, it just became this, you know. And what the lessons learned are from that mission was like for me was there's more to a tactical operation than than meets the eye, right? There's other things to consider. So many other things. Leader yeah. on the battlefield, you need to have those considerations in there. Because if there was another leader on that battlefield besides Chad Jenkins who was really fearful or, you know, not thinking that way, he might have just been thinking, let's stop this at all costs. And I could have just, you know, brought down everything we had on this post. Yeah. And you think about the strategic ramifications of, you know, killing a bunch of Iraqi soldiers and, you know, taking out a bunch of Iraqi material when we're trying to build up this new army to take over their country, right? To take back control of their country. Yep. You think about killing American advisors on the ground and having to, you know, tell people back home and families back home, hey, your 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 son or your your husband or whoever was killed by American forces, like an F-16 dropped the bomb on. Right. You know, like and hell, maybe the, the tanks weren't quite as aggressive as they wanted to be, and then you dropping a bomb on that the top of that hill would have made them even yeah, the more, Hornets. Maybe, yeah, exactly. Maybe they had more a QRF come out or who who knows what it could have happened. Yeah. And and so it became a lesson, and I didn't know this until like last year that they 
I think like the captain's career course, one of those army leadership courses, they, they have this vignette out there to talk about like, what would you do in this situation? Like a seemingly impossible situation to get out of. Yeah. You know, how do you get out? How do you get your folks safely out? How do you respond? Like, how do you return fire? Uh, we had to return fire. We did, but it's just an amazing mission that, you know, nobody really knows about except for the folks who were there. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guess there were some things that came out afterwards about it that, you know, cause the battle space. So we do battle space owner coordination before we go out on these missions. And nobody knew that that element was out there. That's so crazy. a failure in, in, in battle tracking, this is before, you know, the common operating operational picture was, or link 16, other things that we have now that are supposed to help that kind of stuff. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. You know how those guys are. I mean, oh. they, they, they're, they're a little more loose than we are. So they, might just been like, hey, go set up an OP up there. Or just move some tanks over here without telling anybody. You know, it could yeah. have been a, an ambitious battalion commander or something, Iraqi battalion commander. Who knows, man? It was, it was, just, it was gnarly. It was a gnarly yeah. mission. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. It's the, the amazing thing is nobody, you didn't take any casualties. I mean, and you got out of there and you, it was a very unconventional method of, you know, just go block them with a, you know, with a helicopter and let's run so, away. It's a so, unique use of fire support assets. To, <laughs> yeah, for sure. In effect, your expo. <laughs> You know, um, um, and, you know, we, we were, we got, as soon as we got home, almost, we got, but we got on the phone, like trying to figure out who these Apache guys were. Yeah. Can, what can we do? To, can, can put them, we put them in for medals and yeah. Like on the phone with me, I'm like, thank you. Like you guys <laughs> saved our asses. You're did really you good. ever link, did you ever go face to face or link up with them at all? Or we did. Cause this, this generated some, you know, obviously some interest. Sure. Amongst leadership in the task force. So we had they they had to have like an AR, a bigger AR than normal on, on this one. Yeah. And we were able to link up and and and, and do that. I you nice. know, but at the time I didn't establish that relationship. So I to this day I don't remember their names. Yeah. Anything like that. But it was we don't think about it. Yeah, you're not yeah. Who knows it would have been yeah. But it happened on Veterans Day. So Veterans awesome. still we ended up calling it like almost immediately after the event happened. So. Real quick, real, um, I remember I can't. I think I might have mentioned on, on a show, or maybe I was just talking to Brandy about it. But I remember it was either the first time I met you, or one of the first times we were at, like a jaded thunder, and we were in the same vehicle together. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. Uh, um, and we were talking about. I was just kind of like feeling everybody out, like what they wanted to do. And you were the only one that mentioned. You're like, yeah, I'm thinking about getting out of this and getting it, doing it. I, you, I don't think you mentioned the Navy at that point, but you were talking about getting your you know, you know, your, um, higher level degrees and stopping doing this job. And, and that was kind of one of those turning points for me when I was, cause I used to be kind of like that, like, Oh man, if you're not, you know, you need to be a ranger tech P that's about all you can do. Yeah. That's the best, you know, anybody else what I kind of just scoffed at it. But then when you said that, that's, that just clicked something in my head. And I was like, yeah, I'm like what, who, why, why not do something else? Like not, it's not, you know, if you want to, pursue other goals like why not you know and then from that yeah. point on if a guy wanted to and then this is kind of redundant I, from another one but you know if you want to fly helicopters or go to keg or like bcct or just get out and do something else i was like yeah I, i'll fully support you and i you know i couldn't wait to to help the guy out so yeah when you you kind of sparked that in me you kind of made me see like i'll broaden my my aperture you know kind of so yeah, so that was, that, then you were the first one I had heard. A young guy, older guys kind of say that stuff, but as a young guy, I mean, you were relatively yeah. young then, to have that kind of vision, it was uh, it was eye opening. It was you know, so that's cool. Yeah, and uh, you know, academically, so in in Iraq, I, I had a, an experience where I didn't have a. This is my first deployment where I didn't have anything to read, and the NCO threw over a foreign affairs magazine yeah. to me. I never read this thing before, and it was kind of weighty academic journal and right. i found myself interested in it and there was a lot of stuff about iraq in it at the time because it was a topical thing right the war in iraq and sure. i started understanding or like getting my first glimpse into the strategic implications or the strategic discussions about the iraq war you know or yeah i'm deep i'm down deep in the tactical stuff right and i think that reading that periodical on that cot down there in scandia which <laughs> down in Bosworth somewhere, I think uh, it really sparked something in me. So I, that's where I started pursuing my academic career. And I got my degree in 2008 while at the Rangers, went immediately into a master's program, you know, into like geopolitics and, and, and stuff like that. And come back from these missions we're talking about in Iraq 
and start hacking on papers and stuff like that. And yeah, you know, working those things while I'm deployed. Uh, and so the, the, my, my brain started getting rewired to start thinking about things more strategically. Right. So I'm having these experiences like I did with Chad Jenkins, where I'm, he's, there's a bigger picture to what we're fighting right here and our little tactical piece. And then I'm reading academically about how all this stuff works at the strategic levels, both you know internationally and within our own government. So I'm really getting interested in this stuff. And I'm you know about done my master's degree. And well, yeah, about done my master's degree. And I had come to the realization at this point, I'm like 26, 27. This is around the time that I was talking to you, that I talked to you at Jaded Thunder down there at Avon Park. Yeah. And I realized that I had peaked tactically right and yep. i was very young so i wanted to be like when it comes to being a, a jtac right on the front controlling airstrikes you know with your eye on the target in a gunfight that with the rangers i hit that pinnacle at you know 23 all <laughs> right senior airman right I'm an, I'm an e4 and i did i do that for about four years and i'm like I've, I'm already, I've done it. Like this yep. is all I wanted to do and I'm here doing it. And I started getting a little bit tired of it. I, I told somebody my going into my last deployment with the Rangers in 2009, I'd already decided that this is going to be my last one that I was going to move on from the Rangers. Uh -huh. And I told somebody, you know, when they're asking me like what I want to do next or why would I leave this? I said, you know, if I have to plan and execute one more direct action mission, <laughs> I might go, I might go crazy. Like it's, yeah. it's getting boring because a lot of the similar processes happen every time. Right. Yeah. And it's dangerous when you start getting boring because you can start getting complacent. Oh, for sure. For sure. What you're doing. Yep. And, and this might sound weird to some people out there, but it started to feel very easy to me. No, I didn't get any more uh sense of purpose by planning the fire support mission actually i started going to the platoon sergeant squad leader meetings and helping plan like the tactical side of things yeah yeah like i i, I learned this stuff over the last few years and i like slowly inched my way in because i'm the fire i'm one of the fires guys right like i had great relationships with the assaulters with the you know the, the infantrymen mm -hmm. and but you still don't want to like just like wade into their world and start you know giving your two cents right, right. you, you kind of got to slowly dip your toe in and then uh i started doing that and you know planning more at a you know a, a broader tactical level the missions instead of my little narrow piece and trying to help out as much as i can with that and where we're putting people where we're placing people where we're gonna land the helicopters and i got a lot of satisfaction out of that and i'm so grateful that they allowed me to to do that because it was kind of branching out of what, what i was normally used to I mean, that speaks a lot about your relationship with those guys. I mean, the, the fact that they would let you in to, you know, value your opinion on something like that, yes. where normally, yeah, you're an Air Force guy. Just stick to the JTAC stuff. We got this. But, you know, you'd been there with them uh, so often and done, I went to, done I went to a Blod, great job. I went to Blod four times in a row. So like, <laughs> as far as knowing that mission and that terrain for the, the Hilo Assault Force, you know, I was there the first two times with the same platoon. And then the last two times were two different platoons. But they they – picked upon my expertise of operating sure. in that location in that area. And I, I realized though, that I wanted to, to move on. So I'm like, all right, let's commission. And we kind of already talked about that. You know, they didn't have a TACP officer program at the time. I was right. tired of being a JTAC and, you know, let's do something else. Um, my company commander at the time, who's now, I think he's a one star almost, or not, will be soon. Uh, Andy Saslev. Um, he tried to convince me to go be an infantry officer. He said so that he thinks you'd be, you'd be great at that, right? Uh, but at the time, like conventional, infantry, you'd have to go back to conventional, right? And then yeah. try to go back to the Rangers, right? Right. And they're doing like, yeah, they wouldn't months. just take you right in the battalion, so yeah. And they were doing like 15 month deployments at the time, Oof. you know what I mean? Like the conventional army, yeah. And I was like, man, I criminal, man, I don't want to set up for, I don't want to sign up for that right now, right? even though no I, looking back, I think I. I would have really enjoyed being an infantry officer. I really enjoy like that type of leadership that you don't really get all that much as a TACP officer. I think there's a difference we'll say. Um, yeah. There's like a, a command relationship, right? Like, well, yeah, well think about a company commander as a captain and I mean, yeah. think about how many people are in a company. 
and you're out there actually, you know, leading in, in combat and stuff right. like that. Instead right. of, you know, managing and planning in combat and then allowing yeah. others to execute, which is what we do mostly in the attack B community. So I ended up deciding to go to the Navy. Should we pause and talk about, real quick before we get to the Navy, let's quickly talk about when JD and I become, you know, become brothers, like become, become yeah. great. Well, I have that in my notes and I, we kind of skipped over that. Um, Cause it happens right around the same time. Yeah. yeah. As uh, I'm transitioning out. Cause I got to Alaska in 09 to work for red flag. And um, the, uh, there was a, the, the exercise planner was he, he was exercise planner for red flag, but also for all, all the other exercises like Cope North, Cope India, Cope, yeah. whatever. And um, I was Ray asking him, what's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, Bundish or I forget the name. Something. Oh, that that dude was the um, the guy I'm talking about would tell Ray, hey, these guys are coming over, so oh, okay. facilitate their their coming over or whatever. Um, so I said something like, hey, I need JTAX for this this red flag coming up, and he was like, man, I don't have time to think about that. I need jump masters, and I'm like, well, hey, I just happen to be a jump master, and uh, he um, he's like, what? Can you get your hands on any more? I'm like. Yes, I can. I got, I know thousands of them probably or hundreds maybe. And, uh, the first one, uh, I, um, I didn't get you on. There was one to Indonesia, me and Matt Schleich went to Indonesia, uh, for Cope. I think Cope North was there at the time, but then the second one and the third one, uh, what was first in Malaysia or Thailand? Malaysia was first, then India, then Thailand. Did you go to Malaysia or was that, uh, I went to there. Malaysia with you and Ron Fleming. Fleming, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And, but we didn't uh, jump at all because the the parachutes were the wrong kind or something. Or yeah, we, or something. Up, we went all the way to Malaysia just and we had a good time. Like we got we to had a great time. Yeah. We got to experience Malaysia and Kuala Lumpur, <laughs> the great city. Yeah. And I, I just ended up going back there in the navy later on. To the, oh, really? Uh, yeah, fantastic city. Ah, oh, so and, fun. Yeah, we had like a week there that we didn't really work because nothing. We we tried. I, for those listening, we tried hard to try to. We wanted to jump, like we want yeah. to go out there and jump, uh, but it just didn't happen. Oh yeah, we were like calling back and we're like talking to PP, like triple PMs, and we're like talking to you know parachute experts. I'm like, well, this is the kind of shoot they're jumping, and you know, is it in our reg? And yeah, it just didn't work out. No, but, it didn't work out. So the next one, which is India, I yeah, think yeah. is my like. So the, that was the best. This is while I'm transitioning out. So. Uh, out of the military so while we're doing these trips so this is october of 09 we go to india yeah i'm like i've already submitted my package to the navy so I, i'm kind of on this i'm the parachute program manager for the first air support operations group okay i'm just going around jumping out of airplanes <laughs> and then i link up with you and you hook up all these fantastic trips to go jump out of airplanes all around yeah. Asia. Oh, uh, it so was fun. fantastic and before going there you know i was actually quite an india file like i have always been uh intrigued and fascinated by india and indian culture yeah so when i you fit right in oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i got to play some sitar out they there they took to you they they loved you man that they, they, everywhere we went they were just like they couldn't get enough of you man agra india yeah we're out there at the taj mahal and uh yeah taj mahal and we took we rode the we, we crammed in one of those little uh i don't know what they call them over the tuk tuk was it yeah tuk -tuk. yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's fantastic. And, you know, we jumping out of airplanes over, you know, Taj Mahal in the background. Like, it was just, come on. Yeah, it was amazing. It was that amazing. Was then then uh, we go on to Thailand. And yeah. that was significant because that was my last. Like, I, we went to Thailand, like, the first week of March or so of 2010. Okay. Yeah. My last date, my, like, transition to the Navy was, like, 24 March. Wow. So this oh, my God. My last, my last hurrah. Uh, and we jumped – free fall with the tie and we got the tie free fall wings and right right that was like i, I, I have a picture of it like i'm taking knee in the drop zone i got my helmet like the yeah. parachute's kind of spread out it's, it's my last jump like this is my last time that i'm gonna jump halo yeah they lined us all up and that tie uh colonel or whatever gave us the wings and yeah, yeah. so that's where i met gd everybody like I, we met gd at that jade of thunder but that's where we became close and and oh yeah we just clicked we hit it off man that was fun yeah that was so fun fantastic it couldn't then, have gone any better oh yeah it, was, it still like stands out as like a, one of the greatest uh six month periods of my military service so. oh i'm with you same here <laughs> I, it was just such a lucky thing like that i just happened to that guy just happened to bring it up and then you know i just called up 
I can't remember how I did. I call you guys directly, or how did what I do? Like, how did I? How did it yeah, even start that I got? Yeah, you got a hold of you guys. It was within the the Ranger crew, right? And yeah, first ASOG is. Uh, I don't know if we had transitioned, but we were at like we were under Pack App. Like we oh, made a, that's right. That's we right. made a transition, I think, at that point yeah. from ACC to Pack App, and so we were like the supporting one of the supporting units. <laughs> And you, you know, linked in with your Ranger connections to Ron, who was the jump master, Ron Fleming. Oh, yeah, and then you right. and I met and I'm like, hey, I'm the parachute program manager for the whole air sport operations group. So let's go. I'm the guy that you go to when you need jump masters. And it just oh, so that's right. That's right. Cool. Yeah. OK. Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> it now, just yeah. what happens that I'm available and I'm going to do my going away tour as the TAC-E in yeah. the Air Force enlisted guy to uh, just go jump out of planes across Asia. Um, so. I go, I go to Navy OCS in March, 2010. Okay. And once again, I am not prepared. Right? <laughs> How could going you away be? Tour, I mean, honestly? That going away tour was, uh, you know, we took it seriously and, you know, we had a lot of fun and, <laughs> uh, I went to Navy OCS, uh, out of shape. Yeah. And thinking it's just Navy OCS. I didn't yeah, understand like really at the time. And it's ran by Marine drill, drill sergeants, and it was tough. And I'm talking about tough even compared to like TACP schoolhouse standards. Really? Like our drill instructor smoked the crap out of us. Yeah. Constantly. Um, like dudes are falling out. Like guys, now I'm not talking about just like you run of the mill, like, you know, folks who are going in to join the Navy. Like there's guys here in there who are going to be SEALs or, you know, uh, boat team or EOD, like guys who are yeah. in really good shape. And, falling out so i went in there uh, but you know i ended up making it and got my first pickup assignment to san diego you know i'm from california so finally went back to southern california and was stationed in san diego on the god missile cruiser Walker hill nice. cg 52 which is the oldest cruiser in the fleet i had no clue what i was getting into i thought this was going to be maybe a break for me since i've been deploying so much Oh, yeah, we failed to understand that the Navy is a strategic asset and we can stop all the wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria. It doesn't matter where we're at, the, that kind of war, the Navy's always going to deploy. Yeah, they're always going to be out there. We're a blue water fleet, we're international, right? And that's how it turns out. So, I was in the Navy for 24 short months and I spent 17 of it at sea. Oh my gosh, yeah, Jeez. shoot appointment. We left on the same day. So November 30th of 2010, we deployed for seven months. We're like halfway through that cruise out in the Middle East, uh, Fifth Fleet, so out there in the Gulf, going back and forth through the Strait of Hormuz and doing some counter piracy here and there. And they tell us, the, the captain got on the, we were supposed to go back home after that and get into dry dock to get some, you know, refit. Yeah. Right at this crew just got back from a deployment where they had to go to Haiti and then all, like all the way around, they went through the Panama Canal, they went all the way around the horn of south america like so th they'd gone on two deployments back to back essentially the captain gets on the the mic the what they call the one mc and ha like halfway or so through this deployment and says you know hey bunker hill crew uh you guys are doing some great work oh by the way we'll be deploying again next year november 30th same day that is all and you just hear like the everybody just deflated <laughs> Because they knew they're going to come home, get some time off, do a quick workup cycle, training cycle, just like everybody does. Uh, which, when you're in a training cycle in a Navy ship, you're out at sea, right? You're not yeah, home. Yeah. You go home at night. That's right, right, right. So, so that's where you train. That's your that's your duty location is the boat. Yeah, that's right. And so we went on another deployment, a six month deployment. Jeez. Uh, the very next year, same day or same. Yeah, we left the exact same day, November thirtieth, and a lot of time at sea. How is that? I mean, I, I've, I've had little to no experience with the Navy. I don't, I don't know anything about it. I, you know, I talked to some Navy guys that I, I've known, but like, how is it? I mean, is it okay? Is it miserable? Is it fine? Or what? What do you? I mean, how'd you, so, how was your experience on the boat? And this is coming to a lot of uh, heat over the last five or six years, right? Because we had, you know, those horrible incidents over in the Pacific with like the Fitzgerald and the, I think it's Fitzgerald, the John McCain. Like, you know, sailors died at sea because there was collisions, right? Oh, and, right, right. Right. And they're doing all these investigations and trying to figure out, like, why, you know, what's the culture on these ships that, 
you know, people are out of phones. They're not yeah, paying not, attention. They're, they're paying they're, attention. They're, you're, you're losing your, your ability to navigate and which is like a, your primary function as a Navy ship is to avoid collision. All right. <laughs> Before you're fighting everything, you got to avo- avoid collision and, and navigate safely. That's like the, the number one rule. I mean, is it is it likely because every? I mean, I don't want to get if you can't get into it, fine. But I know there's a lot of classifications around um, naval movements and stuff. But is it because everybody's kind of going in the same paths or like how, how do you? I mean, that's a giant ocean out there. How do you even do that? I'll tell you why. Um, you know, I haven't read all those investigations, but what it comes back to, a lot of folks come back to, is the culture within the surface warfare officer community. Yeah. And it is a cutthroat, the, you know, the swows eat their young is the, the, the terminology. And you have a lot of young officers who show up to a ship and are expected to learn everything about that ship. Cause you have like 24 months at the time, I think to get your swoop in or they can kick you out. Oh, wow. You, qualified. you have to learn everything on that ship, the engineering, the war fighting capabilities, the navigation, you have to get qualified in all these watch stations. Wow. You have to stand watch. You have to run your division. And a lot of these you know, young officers have never led people ever. They've come out yeah. of RBC or the academy. And the officer culture at the time was, you know, you get screamed at. Like, it wasn't a very, you know, it wasn't a very helpful atmosphere a lot of times. Yeah. And people don't sleep. They don't get any time to rest because they're either always studying, trying to run their division, trying to figure out how to, you know, lead people they have to stand their watch for four hours either on the bridge or down in engineering or it's just it's non-stop when you're on deployment like that it's non-stop for six seven months yeah and it just creates this this culture on the ship where everybody's just dragging and yeah. they're they're down and when you're up there at zero you know midnight or you know zero two in, in the morning and you haven't slept for days and you're and now you're in charge as the officer of the deck of like safely navigating that ship and you're falling asleep at the radar station or like you know, you're in charge up there. When you're the officer of the deck, you're in charge of that ship. Essentially, yeah. the captain always remains, you know, the captain, but yeah. you're the one safely navigating the ship and, you know, mistakes are made. And that's kind of the, and I'll give you a little, uh, you get screamed at and yelled at constantly. And a lot of these young officers come in, they're just not prepared for it. They don't right. know what they're doing and then they're getting yelled at for it. So where I was able to succeed in that aspect because I, I i got up i got called up to the bridge one time or to the captain's quarters because somebody in my division who i was not near or not leading at the time did something stupid yeah right i'm not there to intervene right but i'm still the division officer so he called me up there to chew my ass which makes it never made sense to me like the to blame like a guy just does something on a whim and you there's no way you could have prevented it no way you could have done anything to you know to mitigate any of it and you're still responsible it seems right. so crazy to me and that's what happened and so he chews my ass and i'm he's really giving it to me and i'm sitting there at parade rest in his cabin just taking it and as i'm he, he's done yelling at me he's dismissed you know and as i start turning around to walk out of his cabin he's like hey brandon wait up a minute he's like you know what i like about you i'm like what's that sir He's like, I can chew your ass and you don't fall apart. A lot of my officers just fall apart. They melt away. And I was like, well, you know, I come from, you know, a, a unique community within the Air Force. I was used to getting my ass chewed. Yeah. Like, getting my ass chewed off and, yeah. and getting smoked. Like I'm used to getting like half to do push-ups and other things when I'm in trouble. Like it's not just an ass chew and there's more that comes with it. So right. I operated fine in that environment of getting my ass chewed of sleep deprivation, you know, these things that I was already used to. But you think right, about right. these officers who are coming into this situation with no experience in this, really. Especially like the ROTC guys. They get a little yeah. bit of academy early on. But as you get a, uh, to be an upperclassman at the academy, you know, you become more of a leadership role and you're doing more of the ass chewing. So that culture was just, uh, it's hard for a lot of officers to handle. And I think that's a contributing factor to a lot of, you know, the mishaps that they've had. For they're sure. trying to fix that over the, over the time. Um, kind of already talked about learning a whole new like sea power and you know, learning a whole new warfare area was fantastic. I really I really enjoyed that and I, I did pretty well at it. Um, as a E01, I I was qualified as a tactical action officer on a cruiser on a warship, which is unheard of. And oh really? 
like the key, you know, like in an OPR, it's like your key point or an EPR, it's like your key point. Like, yeah, that was the key point in that in my last uh, fit rep from there. So I was really doing well there. Um, the culture, as far as like the separation of the ranks, was a little different to get used to, but I, I quickly realized that it wasn't like a derogatory thing and that when you're on ship together for so long, it's necessary. Yeah. In order to allow folks of different tiers of rank to just kind of let loose and not be on. Right. 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 So you have like the E1s to the E6s down in the mess decks and they don't want the chiefs in there. They don't want the officers in there. For sure. And when, in fact, when you go in there, they kind of, you get the stink out. They don't want you down there. <laughs> right. Right. Like, so like and, I can't even be myself because now you're here. Now I got to try to, you know, be respectful right. of you. And yeah, I got to watch chiefs, what I say. The chief's mess, like, even as an officer, like you try to put your head in the chief's mess. Like chiefs will be in there like throwing crap at you. Get out of here. Like, <laughs> you know, they have a little bit more, you know, ability to do that. They don't want you in there. Like that's yeah. the chief's mess. And it's, it's tradition that goes back, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years. Uh, right. Right. Mariners. And in the officer's side, it's a little bit different because it's so you know, formal, but it's also kind of neat to be part of it, I guess. Like, sure. it's a naval heritage when you have to walk into a room and, you know, ask the senior officer who's already eating, like, may I join you? And there's, like, rules and you have to ask permission to leave. Um, you know, it's not like no one ever says no. no hey, right. <laughs> sit down and eat again. But it's more like a formality than anything. Yeah, yeah but, it, it, but I found it kind of, I kind of, I thought it kind of neat. That's yeah. be part of that tradition. And you start thinking of tying it back to history and like, you know, our own naval heritage, John Paul Jones, you know, like Stephen Decatur. Sure. And some of these. Like anybody out there who's a, a soft guy, if you haven't read about Stephen Decatur, you talk about getting an indigenous clothes and going and like storming an enemy ship. Like he's, he's a soft <laughs> operator through and through. Right. Uh, fantastic stories. So I, I really enjoyed my time there in, in the Navy, the two years I was there, but I felt um, with the TACP officer community up and running, that I felt kind of called back to, to help set that up. Well, so talk about that. How did you work? I mean, you're in the Navy, you're doing your Navy thing. How, how'd you get, did you just talk to some people that you knew and they're like, Hey, by the way, there's a tech, the officer we're, we're really stood up now. Or like, how did you, how'd you get exposed to it to, to even, you know, want to transition back to the air force? So I'm still in contact with, you know, friends of mine in the tech B world. And there's sure. guys that I knew like, uh, you know, Brandon Pinto, John Grisella and, and, and you know, Bulldog Smith, like some guys that had become, they were like the first plank owners, you know, Lowry, there's, there's a whole, you know, I know them all now, oh, yeah, yeah. like plank owners of the TACP officer community. And so I'm still in touch with these guys. Facebook is now a thing at this time. Right, right. So you're starting to see more people and then you normally would, and, and things are kind of flowing there. Yeah. And what really helped is Earl, Earl Coble became the first ever JTAC PM up at the Pentagon. At, at half right so right. at headquarters air force so i had like my best friend on the inside there yeah yeah it ended up being helpful later <laughs> for sure <laughs> but uh so yeah i'm seeing this thing stood up and i'm trying to think of my next moves and what i want to do and you know i decided at some point that after i think it was after the midway through that or during that second deployment i was like man i i gotta figure this out i gotta i gotta do something uh so I went up and asked my captain, talked to him about it. He said, Hey, we'd like to like to keep you. You're doing well, but you know, I'm not going to stop you from, you know, I'm not going to stop it. He was a really cool, really cool captain. This is my second captain, uh, a guy named uh, Captain Mike Ford, nuclear guy. He's a brainiac, but also just so down to earth. And was like, I'm not going to stand in the way of anybody, you know, following their, their path. Yeah. And in the Navy, how it works a lot of times, if like the captain of the ship says something is okay, like that's it you know yeah. captains of a naval vessel have lots of power yeah, yeah. you got to make decisions out there with this billion dollar piece of equipment and manpower out there and the navy kind of go so once he said yes i knew the navy was going to be good with it nice but i had to submit the inter-service transfer package to the air force as well which, oh because they still have to say okay and they were they were at a moratorium at the time they weren't accepting packages so i had to get an oh, exception no. to policy which was going to take a long time but they had some benefit for me. I didn't have to re-go through training. So I was really like a ready-made product. Nice. And Earl was up there in this ragtag group of like TAC P thing that they're standing up at half. They had like a colonel, lieutenant colonel, who wasn't a TAC P. He was kind of running the show up there and, and kind of the point of entry for this stuff. And they have this stack of paperwork, 
they're trying to get everything stood up and earl was the one who kept like moving my package <laughs> to, the, to the top of the pile and uh you know inter being that interface for me and that my advocate up there and then it, it did take about six months but after six months of it going through the, it took like two weeks the same thing with my commissioning story air force seems to take forever it took me like yeah. two, three weeks to get my package into the navy to get commissioned and then so a few weeks after that to get my class date same thing with the inter service tra transfer package it was in and out got it back approved it took six months for the air force to approve it jeez but once they approved it it was like pick your orders date when do you want to come back and i said august 21st 2012 and we're out doing exercises at sea and i got on a small boat and went back into san diego and my wife picked me up and we she already packed and we just drove back up to washington state and i had to stop and buy some abus because the air force had switched oh yeah <laughs> so I, just, I literally just got out of like got off the ship went into my car and drove to washington and showed up to work that's crazy there's so, no like formality no trans no uh official transition or anything just oh yeah it was, now, it was now just, you report over here it was a set of orders inner service transfer orders wow and yeah i just reported back to the you know i knew i knew the the um bruce byerly was the it was bruce uh was the group commander out there he knew me so i you know i was able to talk to him and he was able to get me assigned back up there um because my initial thought was like i'll go back over to the rangers at some point that was yeah. like my initial thought makes sense so I, we got back up there and i was tag p officer so did you go to the group or the fifth went to the fifth okay which was, which was great uh you know I'm, and I'm in this constant cycle of wanting to expand my knowledge base. Sure. Right. So I, I broke out of the, the TACP tactical side of things. I went in the Navy. I learned this whole new piece of warfare. I'm like going through that. I've done the master's degree at this point. So I'm like getting the real geopolitical, political science angle of why we do business and how we do business. Right. And I'm just trying to build up that experience. And we just stood up an ASOC at the fifth and I'm in a, I was like the chief JTAC guy. That's what mm -hmm. they put me in first. Um, there's an ASOC deployment coming up. So I volunteered for it. So, you know, a lot of guys, a lot of young officers, you know, are trying to get their JTAC qualification and all these other things, these blocks they need to check. Sure. I'd already done those things. So yeah, I was too young to be a flight commander by, you know, Air Force standards because Air Force right. makes you wait certain time periods and be certain ranks to do certain things, even if you're ready for it at that point. Yeah, heaven forbid it's about experience, not uh, time. Yeah, because you know? I was a I was a first lieutenant at the time, and you know I I felt at the time and now that I could have been a flight commander then, but you got to wait. That's just the way it is. What was your highest rank in the Navy? I made it so two, so lieutenant okay. junior grade, and then so I they just, just trans you just went right over to yeah Air Force O no, two. Okay, yeah, no loss of rank, no loss of time in service. It was just like nice right over there. And so I went on this ASOC deployment and went to Afghanistan and did kind of that operational level mission. Of, yeah. You know, and this is Afghanistan. By this time, we talked about earlier, had really picked up. So now there's yeah. troops in all the time. And we're there trying to figure out how to best get them supported with the aircraft that they need to fight, uh, to, to win these these fights. And so extremely important job. Yeah. And it's a lot of, it gets, you know, crapped on our community about oh, i don't want to do that this you know kind of rear echelon stuff it's like man it's a lot of work they bust their ass up there and they're the ones coordinating all that stuff and there's somebody on the other sure. end of the air operations center saying no we can't send you that or no you know they're the ones fighting for them. And, yeah and, and then making the decisions of where you move these things around the battlefield is very interesting work for me and how to do it i mean you can't just like just start sending people out you know yeah. you gotta you got to make sure that they're not going to run into somebody or, you know, or somebody else doesn't. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a very important job for sure. It I think is. people just don't like it because like you said, it's a rear echelon kind of a job, but I mean, if they could just get out of that mindset and think about how important it is to get th that, those assets out to people that need them. I mean, and that's it's safely, you know, especially for officers and senior NCOs. I think I came out of that deployment with like so much knowledge about the air operations center and how the air force command and controls warfare right like yeah things i didn't really understand were now brought to light and i know all the other senior ncos that were on that deployment and the other young officers the other um, lieutenants and captains had the same experience so i was so happy to do that deployment and, and got back and i felt like i was just a better officer for it and a better tac p for it. oh i'm sure yeah um 
you know, and then from there, I just went into flight command, which was, you know, best job. It was fantastic. I love leading, <laughs> love leading folks and, and young guys and, and getting them to be ready for war. I always felt that was like my, my number one charge. Like you have to be prepared. Sure. And it, a lot of it's informed by the experiences that I had where I didn't, I didn't always feel like I was like, I, I was always confident in my job skill set, but I didn't always feel like I was prepared right. to face what I was going to, what I faced. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make sure that the guys were prepared to do just that. And it wasn't always the easiest thing, right? Like I didn't always make it easy for them, you know? And sure. I think at the end of the day, you know, they ended up understanding that. And I started getting a little bit of like edge too. Like go talk crap to the other flights, right? What are they out there doing? A lot of nothing, <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. You might be digging a foxhole on this, but they're out there having a barbecue. Like you're yeah. better than them. And you're going to be better than them. And they started seeing that, right? And you never know, like, the impact you're going to have. Or, like, you know, I think a lot of folks just leave and they think they had an impact. And, you know, and it's not always a, a, a thing across the board. I'm sure there's people out there that I led that hated me and made to this yeah. day just like me. Um, but they were but probably the ones that wanted to have the barbecues and not do the work, you know. Yeah, I mean and, you know, and I was also a little bit of hothead, though. There are people that, you know, especially in the Navy, like, you're getting yelled at. A lot of that stuff rolls downhill. Sure. And you're tired. Like there are some dudes in the Navy that I lost my shit on. And <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm friends with them on Facebook now. And like, but yeah, we got over it. You have to. It happens, but yeah. I mean, I got a text. I went to after I left Washington, I went to Kansas to do that like operational level like training job to go train mm -hmm. army two stars and three stars and their staffs how to integrate air power into a fight. And I got a text from one of my former troops. Uh he said, like one of the best texts I've ever received in my life, but it, it kind of hits home. Like the working hard and being prepared has benefit. And for sure, for sure. He said, Hey, you know, Hey, sir, we're just all sitting around here, barbecuing the guys from the flight, <laughs> having some beers. And we were just talking about you and we never felt more prepared and, and, and better at what we were doing than when you were here leading us. And they were just, they just wanted to send me a text that says, thank you. I'm imagining a bunch of tack sitting around half drunk barbecuing, but you know, and you're on their mind. That's right. And reminiscing about the time where, you know, I did make him put on face paint. Um, but when I first showed up to that flight, I, I sent them out on a convoy and they didn't even put like antennas on their trucks. So I'm like, how are you going to talk to one another? Like you guys don't have the basics down and that you have to learn some hard lessons. Yeah. But we got yeah. there by the time, you know, we got up and running, and I empowered the NCOs to do it. Myself and my first flight chief was Jason Smith, and I had Justin Keogh. Like, okay. So it wasn't just me doing this, right? This my, yeah, my yeah. Behind every officer, every good officer, there is a fantastic senior NCO or NCO sure. right next to him, right? That is the strength and the backbone of our military force. This is the strength and the backbone that makes us better than any country in the world. Firmly believe For that. For sure. Yeah, and as a quick a quick aside, in my current role as you know, as national strategic advisor to Matt Gates, we are talking about why are the Russians having such a hard time during the initial invasion of Ukraine, and that's one of the things I said. I said they do not invest in command and control; it's a very rich system, and they do not empower their NCOs and their troops to make decisions, right, and to be leaders. So they're yep. stagnant, they're scared, and they're frozen solid in, in fear of doing anything to make a decision. Whereas we empower NCOs. That's why they're called non-commissioned officers. So, so I went off on a little tangent there, but I really feel strongly about the NCO Corps of the United States military. It is oh, for sure. the backbone of why we are as effective as we are. I agree. I couldn't agree more, for sure. And so my, my senior NCOs, we put out this challenge of like, you're going to create your own training program. You're going to create, you're going to make yourselves better. Like, we'll approve it. Here's the parameters. Now go out and create. And yeah. They did a bang up job. I got Jeremy Bowling over from the Rangers to run it. You know, he came over and was one of my, my bailos. And man, they nice. really they really took off and they took ownership of it. And it was just such a, a great year and so so fulfilling to see them grow, these young guys grow into what I thought was a well oiled, you know, ready to go flight. And well, obviously it paid off from getting that, you know, that that text is a testament to you know, your influence on them and the, the impact you had on those guys. So that's cool, man. And and like I said, I just, the, the other end, like Jason Smith and Justin Keogh had such a role in that, you know, those yeah. NCOs 
senior NCOs going out there because there's times where I'm like, we're falling short. And <laughs> that's that's where the senior NCO just looks at me and is like, sir, sit down. All right. I got this. All right. Yeah. Okay. And you as an officer have to, re you know, understand that and realize it and sit down when they yes. tell you, you know, that's a, that's also a sign of a good leader when you can, when you know when to step back and say, yeah. all right, they got it. I need it. Cause I mean, I have a tendency to do, I had a tendency to do that and kind of still do with everything I do, but like getting a little too more, too involved saying it too many times, you know, like just, you know, do you, yeah. are you sure you have it? And they're like, God, we got it, man. Just shut up. You know, and that, that experience, really in the, that experience in the Navy really helped that out because I came into a world that I literally didn't know anything about. Right. <laughs> right. So my, my chief petty officers, who were my, you know, my division chiefs, I told them, like, you got to grab me by the scruff and you got to lead me around yeah. and, and get me in the right place and keep me out of trouble. <laughs> keep me, keep me learning. And I, they were, I had great chiefs and, and it was such a formative experience to, yeah, I really had to trust them. What a weird thing for them having some air force guy all of a sudden be in charge of them. And they're like, I mean, I, I can't imagine what was going through their head. You know, I'm sure it was, uh, you know, like you said, it was probably a little strained at first, but I'm I'm sure they, with you asking them to to take charge, I'm sure it was it worked out really well. They started knowing a little bit about my history. I think there was a little bit of credibility that came with it. Yeah. Um, you know, like that I've been a warfighter, that I've I've been out there and and, and you know been in some situations and had yeah. some. Yeah, you had some street cred. And, and you weren't just you know, they, wet behind the ears, kind of a new. Yeah, guy. and and, it, and that's kind of how it is for a lot of the folks in the Navy, even who come mustangs like go from the enlisted to an officer um, you know it's just like anywhere else right those those prior service folks they not all the time it's not 100 of the time but they yeah they've been there in those positions they've slept in those birthings they've <laughs> right. you know, swept those decks like they they know what it's what it's about and they that's formed them into the leader they are so. yeah that's a good point so you went what was it that you said you went to kansas what what exactly was that what'd you go what'd you do there so yeah, they, they, this is the first time they had TAC P's stationed there at Fort Leavenworth. Okay. And for years and years, they had an Air Force element. They're still there at uh, that 1505th. And they were doing, you know, as much work as they could. They're, they're there to try to teach um, two star, three star staffs, like how to integrate air power and, and use close air support and how to plan for it and all that stuff. And they never had any. TAC P experience there. And yeah. they oftentimes would only have maybe a couple fighter guys. And of those fighter guys, they might be like F 15 C guys or, you know, guys who didn't weren't involved in their ground game. Yeah. Yeah. So you had this group of, of officers, they're all officers who were doing the best they can to try to learn and to try to teach. So I'm not taking anything away from those guys. Like, for sure. Um, yeah. They, exactly. They, they know what they know. They're working their asses off. Yeah. You, to try to get this done. And they finally, somebody finally lights went off. Well, we have tech officers now. Like maybe we should send some of these guys over there. And uh, Mike Hayek was our career field manager at the time. And he, we were talking about my next assignment after Fort Lewis. And I was thinking about Hawaii. Like there's room to grow in Hawaii, other jobs and stuff like that. There's a, uh, cause I'm thinking outside of just the squadron, right? There's sure, sure. a sea out there. There's combat command. There's pack, yeah, pack there's after there's and, yeah. pack. There's lots of things you can move around out there. And he's like, hey, man, I just want to ask you, like, what do you think about this? And my initial response is like, man, Leavenworth, <laughs> Kansas. Uh, but, you know, my uh, Kristen's sister was married at this point to an Air Force guy who was stationed at Whiteman Air Force Base, you know, an hour or so away. Nice. So very close. Um, her parents are at this point living in Minneapolis, which is, you know, six seven hour drive sure so we talked it over and she actually got very excited about going to kansas because of these she wanted to be close to family so i said yes and again it ended up being super beneficial because i learned so much about the operational level of war from not just the air component but the ground component aspect of it uh, i became a well I became a much better officer knowing the full and like i said i've always been kind of interested on in how it all works yeah at the bigger levels and that's what I'm there to teach. So it, it became a fantastic opportunity for me to do that. But I, I get, I do get bored in positions very quickly. Yeah. Uh, military. So, well, once you get exposed to everything that you 
can get exposed to there, yeah, you want to probably move on after that. I, you know, I do. Like, yeah. I got all this info, and let's. Yeah. And it becomes monotonous. You know, like you, you, you're gone a lot because you're at the warfighter exercises, which is like the culminating event for these these staffs to do their 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 training. Right. And so you're going. You're deployed. You are not deployed, but you're TY all the time. You're gone all the time, and the jobs there don't change. And you see a lot of the same mistakes over and over again. <laughs> yeah. It becomes kind of tedious even though I've learned a lot, but it's about this time that Brandon Pinto reached out to me and said, Hey, like I kind of got thrown into this gig and it's been great. Like I'm on the current operation staff, the J through three at JSOC and it's a TACP position. Like, do you want to come? I got, I got a PCS. Do you, would you like to, would you consider this? And I was like, it's funny you mentioned that because it's actually, <laughs> when I was looking at all the jobs available out there, like searching in before we had this new system where you can see everything. You had to like kind of dig for it. Yeah. And I saw that position on there and I was like, that's where I want to go. This is a couple weeks later, Brandon Pinto's on the phone with me. Like, hey, do you want to come fill this position? Potentially. <laughs> Crazy. So it worked out. So I only spent two years in Kansas. Like I had to get a, a waiver to, to leave early. And uh I you know went to JSOC and interviewed and did all that psych evals and all the things they do there to assess you. Yeah. And after two years in Kansas, I went to Fort Bragg and got on staff there at the J33 in the current operations section, which is nice. just another fantastic place to be. I mean, you're around officers of the highest caliber. Like, everybody who's coming out of that, especially in, in, in CHOPS, current operations. Right. Like, that's, like, all the different units out there are sending, like, their best officers there for staff experience before they go out and take command of, like, squadrons and, and stuff like that, right? Right, right. Army, Navy. Uh, so you're just around like the brightest and best guys and gals and that goes across all of JSOC like it's just such a, a rewarding place to be um, plus I'm sure you were exposed to so many like like when you're at the Rangers or you're at uh, an SF unit or wherever you are um, you only see your little piece of the pie but being at that level I'm sure yeah. you were like exposed to everything that was going on and you, I mean every mission yeah. that was going on yeah, and there's a lot going on, you know, some yeah. pretty important missions going on in the, you know, special operations in the strategic world. Yeah. Around those times, you know, like Baghdadi raid and, you know, the strike on Suleimani. And there's Give me, a lot tell me on. everything about each one in detail. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> That's the hard part about this section of the, uh, the, the, you know, the talk. I can't really delve into a lot of Yeah, uh, that. it's like I was at JSOC, the end. And then, yeah, yeah the next exactly. Uh, so, it, it was just so rewarding, but again, I get I get really bored doing the same things over. And I was kind of also hamstrung by again the rank is a problem because yeah. I'm in a major's position, but I'm a captain, and they won't send me to be an LNO anywhere, which is a lot of my you know colleagues are doing because they don't want the perception of a captain. Like it means like JSOC maybe thinks less of you. Oh, uh, okay. Send the captain to to PACOM. Right? Yeah. Or, or so like they only send a captain. What the hell? What, That's they right. Don't, they don't consider this important. And and the staffs, are which is crazy. They can't. It's not like they can send out your package ahead of time and be like, "Yeah, he's a captain, but he's done yeah, all this yeah. stuff too." You know, it's so, like they just. It's just easier. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to be fair, the staffs you're dealing with up there are all like 06s and above. So sure, um, there, there's a lot of heavy hitters at these geographic combat commands that you have to go to at the agencies, like the interagency places, right? Like state department, wherever. Sure. So sure. I was really limited in that. What I can do. Uh, I did spend some time as an aide de camp to one of the, the one star air force generals there who I had met on a deployment when I was with the Rangers as an NCO, he was Lieutenant like Colonel at the time. <laughs> and we're still great friends. Now he's a three star uh, raising Kane, Dan Kane. Nice. We see each other at like one of my first meetings at JSOC, like our first operational sync kind of look at each other across the room <laughs> and then we like oh my gosh like we were out on missions together like i got him out on some <laughs> missions and now he's a one star and i get like a tap on my shoulder a couple weeks later and it's his aide like hey like general kane said you're gonna be the aide now like because he was leaving that aide it was it was his time was up oh no so yeah all right and which was awesome and then i went back to current operations and then again i'm starting to get bored with the same old thing for about a year and uh, I applied to be on the, the commander's action group for the commanding general, for Lieutenant General Howe at the time, and be like a strategic advisor to him. And nice. interviewed, and he picked me up, and I mean, that was fantastic. Now I'm there, 
under the direct wing of a three star who has so much in his portfolio and I'm exposed to so much of how the inner government works and other things. I mean, we went up to New York City and I, I prepared this whole, not the scheduling, I prepared the whole meeting for like topics and whatnot for a 90 minute sit down with Henry Kissinger on Park Avenue. Wow. Like I'm sitting there and I remember I'm a geopolitical, like international relations guy. So yeah, Henry yeah. Kissinger is kind of, a, he's one of the heaviest hitters of all That's time. The, yeah, the, the, yeah one of the history. guys, yeah. And here I am in his office, you know, sitting there with the command sergeant major, uh, General Howe, and we're just having a talk about the world and Jeez. about what's going on and about what's going on with Turkey. Is that surreal but, or what? Yeah, like I'm so I'm there. Remember, I'm I'm there to serve General Howe. So I'm really trying to take good notes so we can because he wants to send this out to all his commanders to like you know put the information out there, the experience to everybody, so we can all benefit. And that's my job is to get all of those capture that data and then put it into a new format so we can send it out. And I'm trying to take all these notes and I'm looking around Kissinger's office and it's just like, like we got selfies just like our jackass, you know, military buddies. Like he's got selfies up there with Mandela, you know, like right. he's like at the, you know, he's at the Paris meetings for like Vietnam. Like there's just all these history around you. Yeah. There's like all over his office and I'm trying to take notes and I'm just looking around at all these pictures like <laughs> him and Nixon, like walking on the, the the lawn, you know, like where am I? Yeah, how did yeah. I get here? And <laughs> we're walking down the street the next day or so. We're like in suits, and I'm walking down next to uh, General Howe, and he's like, even he was like, that was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my life. And he's like, I actually told my dad that we were meeting with Henry Kissinger, and his dad told him, I was like, why would he want to meet with you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this three star. Good point, Dad. Good point. Uh, <laughs> but it just shows like we were all kind of just, you know, the opportunities that we had at the time, whether it was just, you know, this captain um, or, you know, a three star general. We were just in this moment. It was just fantastic. So that's just one yeah. of the many experiences that I had while working for him and like under his mentorship, which is fantastic. And yeah. you know, he was instrumental in, 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 in helping me because I knew where I wanted to go next. I wanted to be in this legislative fellowship program. I've known mm -hmm. this for a couple of years at this point. So that was always the plan in my head. And and how's that going? How's uh how was that uh transition from to up to the up to Washington? So it's fantastic. Like this this uh as I'm kind of looking at the you know, I'm at the I'm at 22 years now, so I'm kind of looking out to you know what's happening, what's next sure. after the military. And you know, this is my interest. Like I am in, in, I'm into policy. I'm into, you know, politics. I'm into all these things. So this is why I wanted to do this fellowship to begin with. So when I got selected for it, I was, you know, static. And yeah. Um, so we get up to Washington. They sent me to, we do a development tour. I did six months in the assistant secretary of defense for special operations, low intensity nice. conflict. That Lieutenant Colonel that I met in Iraq, who I then became his aide, General Kane, like, you know, his relationship building and kind of hooked this gig up for me to, to do this development tour in that office. So I got to see a lot of how the National Defense Authorization Act was formed from that perspective. Yeah. And then, you know, I got assigned to to Representative Gates's office uh, from Florida's first district. And yeah, I, I come in there and like this, I'm kind of like wonky like that. So I, I, I had a great time transitioning in. It was a great office. It's a great office, a lot of high, high energy and morale. And, and, you know, the staff is great. I'm definitely the older guy in the staff. Most staffers are like 25, 26. Yeah. yeah. Really smart. But, the brightest but, people. Uh, in the grand scheme though, he's, he's a relatively younger dude. I mean, he's not like a, maybe yeah, midway. We're the, we're the so, same age. Yeah. So do you go to Florida with him or do you just stay in Washington the whole time? And then, I, I could go to Florida with him. I just haven't. There's, we have a we have a military director down in the district there. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if I we kind of had the agreement, like if, if it was a, a required for me to go down there, that I would go. Sure. Obviously, but <clears throat> he didn't feel, and I didn't feel like I needed to go down to the district to get a familiarization with the district because yeah, you know, I've been to Pensacola many times. I've been on the base <laughs> there. I, I've been to Hurlburt, Eglin. Like I know, I know the area, you know, fairly yeah. well. So, um, yeah, it's it odd just, that it's crazy that that's his district where, you know, 
your old stomping grounds, essentially. Yeah. You know. <clears throat> yeah. So we're, we call ourselves the geriatric millennials, and <laughs> you know, so him and I can really, you know, we we talk to all the young staffers about like one hour photo and oh, yeah. things that they don't know anything about. Um, right. Right. Wow, you guys, what? That's crazy. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. You developed what? Yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> So that's great. And, you know, the office there is also just, you know, it's the way he works is very, you know, let's bounce ideas off each other. It's a very creative space and you can yeah. like talk to him just like another person. And, you know, that's not because every office in Congress is different. Yeah. There's a lot of folks that are like that. There's a lot of Congress, you know, folks in Congress and the Senate that are in the House or the Senate that are like that, where it's very rigid. You don't ever yeah. see the member that you work for. And I'm just so glad that that wasn't my experience. Like, yeah, he seems like a like a go getter. Like he's, you know, very motivated and uh, not. He doesn't seem as I don't want to. He doesn't seem as fake as like a lot of the guys. You know, like he seems like a kind of a down to earth guy. Kind of like uh, he says what he means and he's not afraid to say, you know, speak his mind. I guess uh, that's kind of what I've noticed from what I've seen on the TV and whatever. But yeah, and he's like a good dude. You know, definitely a, a polarizing figure, and there's a lot of folks. It's on both sides of the coin on the thoughts on that. Um, but as far as the work we do in the office, like when it comes to the military, <clears throat> and especially veterans, like yeah, when it comes to veterans, he's 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 all on board. Like when they were we were talking about like the PACT Act or or one of those you know big veterans bills that came across Congress this last year, and somebody had raised a concern about the cost, the price tag it was like three billion dollars, and he looked over at this other staffer and just said three billion it's like pocket change for our veterans right yeah you know, like and walked on nice like, so like I, I knew right off the bat like okay we're gonna take care of the troops like we're, we're all about this and that that was huge because that you know in my side stuff i've been doing like in my local community my county you know i'm in the calvary county here veterans affairs commission working yeah. in that veteran space i do a lot of work with the state veterans affairs and I just recently got on the National Association of Counties Committee for Veteran and Military Services. So nice. Doing a lot of work in the veteran space. And it was, you know, very helpful to to get into an office where we had a, a member of Congress who was so passionate about it. And, you know, to, to I don't think we've ever voted no on a I don't think he's ever voted no on a veterans issues that I've seen. Yeah. That's gonna help them out. Well, do you wanna um Speaking of that stuff that you're into in, in your county, do you want to expand on that at all? I know we um, there's a lot of not only uh, just basic veteran stuff, but like a lot of mental mental health stuff that you have been very passionate about. Do you want to go into any of that kind of stuff? Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, the, we all have friends and we we're, we're around a lot. Our community is a community of warfighters, like our, our TACP community and then the Rangers and the, you know, the special operations, even the convention. I mean, this isn't just special operations, right? Conventional army, all the sure. folks we work with that are, are in these war fighting roles and that are friends of ours. Now we see the effects that warfare has on people, right? Right. And it affects everybody differently, but there are a lot of people struggling out there. Mm -hmm. Lots. Of and the mental health part of it is it's huge. And it's, it's something that I'm passionate about because I made a mistake. I made a mistake with my best friend back in like 2007 when he asked me if I'd go, you know, seek help with him. And, you know, I, he's like, he was thinking about seeking help because he, he wasn't, he wasn't feeling quite right. You know, he, sure. he was kind of hurting and I didn't understand PTSD at the time. I still thought it was a weakness. And I told him, why would I go with you? Why would I do that? I was like, I told him I'm not the one with the problem. Yeah. And I let my best friend down. Like I, I let him flat down. I failed him. And, he went on to deploy several times after that, right? So, you know, and this this is something he has, you know, this is something he's gonna deal with. And I always think back, like, you know, what if I, you know, what if I'd done better? And so that's really kind of forms, yeah, you know, that experience. And now that I I've, I'm older and I know better, and I know that human beings aren't wired to see certain things. We're clearly not wired for them. And when we see those things, you know, a lot of folks have this reaction and their mm -hmm. mind it, it's you got to unpack it somehow and it's not so you know i've been in that space and i've been really looking into different things like um different treatments and kind of really get interested in different treatments for traumatic brain injury and and, and ptsd 
because yeah. I think what we're seeing now is like a lot of the cocktails of medications that these guys are on just aren't working. Right. Right. They're, they're, they're it's really just masking symptoms we're trying to, and you know, they're taking eight, nine, 10, 20, 30 pills and they're miserable. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's, it's not making them feel any better. It's just kind of, it's it's not only do they have the the PTSD, but now they're having to deal with these the the side effects of these drugs they're taking. So yeah, yeah. And about a few years ago, um, you know, a friend of mine had approached me about that he was a guy who's struggling that he was going potentially down to Mexico to do this treatment for using like psychedelics. Yep. I have heard about that. Yeah. And when he told me this, I was like, you're nuts. What are you talking about? We're going to Tijuana and like what do shrooms and then everything's going to be hunky dory. Like it sounds crazy to me. Right. Uh, I started reading more about it and, you know, I figured out then it's not just, you know, guys just doing shrooms or psilocybin right. DMA, like at, at their house all day. It's not that it's, it's, psychotherapy you know control. It's control there's micro dosing yeah there's different exactly things you can do. yeah and i started talking to some of our brothers like some people we know very well I'm like hey and they, to a man they're like my life's changed my life has changed because of this treatment and i started reading more about it and studying it more and there's a great documentary on how to change your mind on netflix i'll plug that that really okay. talks about the history of this research and how it was being used in the 50s and 60s until the war on drugs started really under nixon and it just went out like this research black hole yeah and i'm not saying this is a, a panacea right there's no silver bullet typically to for sure it. but all the feedback i've gotten from everybody who's gone through these types of treatments has been phenomenal i know there's you know it's working its way some of these like mdma and still seven are working their way through fda approvals and there's a whole center here at johns hopkins university up in baltimore I just uh, Special Operations Association of America. We just did a you know, discussion up here at the Navy Club about psychedelics and, and its effect. And it's like, if we have another method to make people feel better, like we need to be exploring every avenue because what's going on isn't working. For sure, and this seems to be helping a lot of a lot of people. So I, I became a believer in it. And <clears throat> interestingly, we're sitting there in the National Defense Authorization Act um, market, they call it, in the in the House Armed Services Committee. It's the marathon committee that starts like 10 in the morning and goes to like three in the morning. The next day. And yeah. uh, Congressman Moulton from Massachusetts introduced an uh, amendment to allow to make the DOD do a study on the uses of medical cannabis for service members on uh, terminal leave as a substitute for opioids and other things that they're used to treat PTSD and, 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 and TBI. Right. So this thing passes, this amendment passes the House, the committee. And as uh, Rep Gates is walking down the aisle, he leans over and whispers in my ear. He's like, I want to do an amendment on the floor to add psilocybin and MDMA to this. All right. So, we, oh, OK. Like, huh. so we, we get that typed up. Um, uh, you, you talk about two sides of the political spectrum. Yeah. AOC ends up offering an identical amendment. Really? Right. So you got, you know, Rep Gates and uh, Rep. Uh, yeah, two different, two, pol uh, two polar opposites. That's right. And this amendment made it into the House version of the bill. So we'll see what happens. It's still got to go through the conference process as the House and the Senate reconcile the differences between their versions of the bill. But right. point being is that there's there's movement in this direction. And I think it's so important, important because so many of our brothers and sisters are suffering out there and yeah we can find any type of treatment that's going to work and not work in the sense that it's just making them zombies and drowning them out of life then we need to explore it and, well uh, i think we've already seen what opioids can do and the the harmful effect they have so like yeah. if we're if we're willing to go down so far down the opioid road to where it's a pain it's an epidemic then why not try something else you know like hey maybe we should try it. if we're if, if we're so willing to go all in on that, I mean, I'm sure it has a lot to do with money and pharmaceutical companies and stuff like that. But yes. Uh, yes. if we, if you want to boil it down, if you want to peel it all away and think about veteran health, then yes, I think, I think anything is on the table. I frankly, I mean, it's not for everybody. And I don't think, I don't think that, like you said, it's not a one size fits all for everyone, but if a guy does something and it makes him not want to 
kill himself or not want to, you know, stay in his house and drink all the time or, you know, not want to talk to or if he wants to get him out of the house and wants to talk to people, then I think it's I think it should be on the table. You know what I mean? That's the, that's the story I'm hearing. There's like three or four uh, guys at this last uh, Special Operations uh, Association of America event that I went to a small room, you know, like 20, 30 people over hors d'oeuvres and just like, you know, drinks and, and talking about this stuff. Yeah. And to a to a to a person, these these individuals like they just they couldn't not function anymore. Like their TBI was like they couldn't get their words, they couldn't speak very well. Like they were just falling apart. And yeah, and then, and then all the pain from all the experience of what they saw and then burying buddies and all that. And you're right, to a person, they all turn to alcohol. Yeah. Blackout. Well, why do you think though? Because yeah. it's legal. Now, if you right. th- that I don't want to get on a soapbox here, but my idea of alcohol compared to everything else is it's just it has been accepted for so many years that we just well, alcohol is OK. It's legal. You can just drink as much as you want of it. When really, if you if you look at the statistics, alcohol has killed more people than all the drugs put together. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's, it's more it's the most dangerous drug out there. And it's just it's a business. So I think we, you know, I don't know. That's and that's why these guys are turning to it. Now, I think it just like. And I don't know, I don't know much about it, but I, it would stand to reason that if you could like take a little micro dose of something like psilocybin or MDMA or, or whatever, um, not enough to make you, you know, really trip out, but just enough to kind of just calm you down a little bit. You know, I mean, I think it might be a little more beneficial than, say, guzzling a, a, a whole thing at Jack Daniels or whatever. You know? Yeah. Well, I guess from the science behind it, it just it, it those things we pack down in our rucksack are left there and they're hidden behind, you know, the different brain waves and you know all the different things firing right and you're unable to unpack it you just drowned it right mm-hmm. and but these what we've seen in in microdosing and whatnot is that these brain functions start through this experience start to open back up and people start unpacking like slowly of- like i think yeah. i don't i think people i think the problem is and may i'm not a doctor or anything but it it's not if it may not be a problem of not being able to unpack it. It just unpacks all at once. And it's like, you know, boom, and it's right in your face and it's too much to handle. But if you could like, right. if you could like slowly unpack it one thing at a time and then deal with that, put it over here, compartmentalize it or whatever. I, yeah, I think it'd be working a little bit better, but yeah, I think the alcohol, like you said, it just drowns it away or numbs you to the, you know, to all that pain. And then yeah. they, you get it, you know, you get out of it and you're, you're sober again and all that stuff comes rushing back and, it's just a vicious cycle. So, yeah. And and the, yeah, so that's something I'm interested in. I'm also interested just in like, you know, like I said before, like public policy, you know, legislation, these are things that I'm interested in. And in my local community, you know, it's, it's focusing on some of the things that can make, you know, veterans lives better, like here in Maryland and where I live. Right. So like we're trying to work, like it's expensive to live in Maryland and a lot of folks can't afford the the taxes and everything else that, especially people transitioning out of the service, Sure. lose folks that are that maybe lifelong Marylanders. And uh, so we're working on like tax credits in the, the county based off levels of disability to, you know, property tax credits so they can make it more affordable for them to buy a house. And nice uh, for gold star spouses, like hundred percent, hundred percent tax credits work in these things, to try to get them through to, to make life a little bit more affordable for them here. So it's all these different little public policy things. And, 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 and just trying to make the life of the veteran more uh, accessible and, and that transition to make it easier sure. uh, because it's a lot. And uh, yeah. it's, it, it, you know, you got, the, you got the VA and you got all these other things that are very complicated processes and organizations to bureaucracies to break through. Right. But people don't think about this is that there's a lot of different organizations that mean 100% well and they've tried to fill these gaps and, and create these little niche organizations would it be like equine therapy or you know there's a, there's a million of them out there art therapies sure. or you know go learn how to scuba therapies right yep the point is there's thousands of them mm-hmm. and even this can be overwhelming to a lot of folks who are already going through a lot of overwhelming things so yeah of all these nonprofits that are trying to help me out like which ones do i talk to who which one do i need which one's best for me that in itself can be confusing so there's just yeah. a lot out that's there a good point do so I have to digest. And I think anything we can do to help people maneuver that transition um, is key because they got to get treatment if they need it. And they got to be well prepared to get out and live that other part of their life and define yeah, like maybe, identity. Like, 
Right. Like maybe have a focal point for all those organizations to go through. And then you can sit a guy down and be like, Hey, here are your options. Instead of them trying to help to figure it all, you know, is it a, is a legitimate company? Are they just trying to, you know, are they just trying to so make much. money on the nonprofit side? You know, so what? Yeah. It's so it's yeah. so, it's so vast. It's just, it's, and like I said, a lot of this is for good reason. A lot of these nonprofits see the problems with transition assistance programs and where they, sh they fall short. Mm -hmm. right? um, you know, when the military does anything, they kind of just do a standard thing and they say, okay, this is how we do it. <laughs> right. Now everybody has to do it. Right. It's not, <laughs> right, right. it's not, you know, modular. So you could have the most pristine resume that's already translated into civilian speak, but you're still going to sit through that, you know, eight hours of training on resume building at All your right. transition program. Right. Like that's yes. just a small example, but. I, I, I totally that's the military exactly. is right. Like, all right, it's just easier to make it all one one size fits all, and you know, right. instead of it takes too much time and back, effort. And they could say, "We made this mandatory. We've done our due diligence. We have provided this training. And we're doing our part." Yeah. Right? And then, farewell to you. Yeah, exactly. So, Regardless of how beneficial it may be, that's right. And a lot of or folks are not beneficial. Don't find it beneficial. So there's other programs, especially in the soft community, like honor. We have a lot of honor foundation. Is one of them. Like I don't know much yeah. about them, but I just see them. I know a lot of guys have used. Uh, these transition programs. Yeah. It does seem out. like soft is um, kind of uh, done a little better job, I guess, maybe to yeah. maybe I think we have better easier. numbers. I think we have better numbers. For them because they're such a small, it's a smaller community or something, uh, but I don't know, but yeah. But, yeah so that's, that's uh, yeah, this is some of the things I'm working on the side here. You know, that's awesome. I'm not doing uh, my legislative work for rep cases. Office. Well, you know, just well as I do that, you know, we, people say, you know, think globally, but act locally. But I, I mean, I think you almost have to act locally and, you know, think locally. I mean, I think locally, if everybody would kind of like put all their effort into their piece or their community, you know, I think it would be a lot better. I think all those communities would eventually gel together, you know, in, in the long run. But, you know, when you try to do too much to, too, or you try to think too big, it's almost like kind of gets lost, you know, the, the, the effort kind of get goes away where the, whereas like you're saying like if you you can focus on these are real people i see them every day these guys are in my community i can affect them um i think that that seems not only more beneficial to them but almost like cathartic to you you know like you're actually seeing the results of what you're doing you know or something that, like that. and that 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 translates so beautifully into like just the political atmosphere of the country right now right like yeah we get so caught up we being the collective we in the the media frenzy that is national politics all right right that we're so worried about you know who's leading what party and you know you know what what are they doing in the house and senate and but you look at like down ballot voting and and, and turnout like it, it's not there right right don't show up for those things and it's like the, the the people who are vote who are elected to your county commissions or your city government your city council like these are the folks who fund your schools they fund your, your police department your water like everything that you actually look at and touch in your community is probably started at a local level. And yet, right. Because of social media, the 24 hour news cycle, we're so focused on what, you know, the national level is doing and what do they do up there, you know, in Congress and whatnot, as they say, Hey, like now we're the ones because everybody's turning to them. They now expect that they're the ones who have to fix everything. <laughs> right. And they weren't meant to be the ones who fixed everything. When exactly. The created. They didn't have social media or technology to reach down and, and micromanage everybody. Right. They expected your local town to figure it out. Exactly. The law. Yep. And there's something about that, it's something empowering to your local community about that. So I'm I'm huge here in, in, in my county, like trying to pay attention to what's going on here at home. Like this is where yep. further up the ballot you go, the farther you are from your doorstep. Sure, for sure. Yeah. And, and, the, and the, the less they, and what people think that, that the top of the ballot is affecting your community, but this is not really the case. I mean, if you look at it, yeah, they're voting on these, these broad issues, but the, really the people that are affecting you right now today are the dudes at the lower end of the ballot that are, you know, you know you're trying to, you know, like you just like all the people you mentioned. So, yeah, yeah I think, yeah, that, that it's, it's the whole media frenzy and we all get swept up in it. And I, mean, I yeah, really, for sure. really, anybody who listens to this, I just implore you. I can't say this any more emphatically. Like, Pay attention to what's going on in your city, your town, your county, like your your little state legislative district, like what's going on in your state. Like this is where the the everything's supposed to really happen. 
Right. And uh, this is the stuff that affects your life. And you, you got to pay attention. Yeah. Dig in, find out who these people are. You know, I mean, you, it may not be these people that kind of don't figure out who their candidates are. You know, they, they say, I'm going to vote all blue or I'm going to vote all red. Yeah, that's you may be voting for the worst dude ever. And he may be of all the blue guys, four of them might be great people. But then you got that one dude in there with that one, you know, whoever, you know, you got to figure out what these guys are, what these people stand for and what they're going to do for you. And, you know, a lot of people don't, don't take the time to kind of dig in. I don't know. It seems it seems like they're their own worst enemy in that regard when they don't try to figure out who they're voting for. You know, that's like, right. Yeah. You know. Keep it local. Yeah, for sure. Keep it local. All right, man. Well, this is great. Uh, I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I, I had such a blast. Um, and uh, I hope everybody else did, too, because you're like I said, your career is just so awesome and so like unique to uh, what from what most people experience. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, it's I, I'm so glad you're doing this. Like it's so cathartic in a way to sit down with your friend and just kind of go over things. Right. And, yeah. And just and talk. And, you know, I, I feel like if one person listens or if 10 people listens or for a thousand people listen, you know, what, all the better. But like just the fact that you and I are having a conversation, just reconnecting with a friend with a friend. For sure. Uh, that That's just priceless. Right. So, yeah. Like, I'm just happy to sit here and do this. Even if it's just like, we, need, we need to FaceTime more often. Like, I know, I know. <laughs> um, but thank you for having me on, and and I really appreciate it. Um, you're right. Like I, I've, I've purposefully, I've been purposeful in my career to try to expand, to try yeah. to get broaden my horizons, to have a better understanding of the things that are going on around me, whether it be yeah. in my military career or you know, in our local government or in the academic world, you know, like finishing out with my doctorate, like getting it all together because I just want to have different experiences and broader understanding things to, you know, maybe see how I can make my life and other lives a little bit better. Yeah. And, uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to be pinned down on any one thing, I guess what it comes down to. So I've chosen this very crazy and very odd career path and academic path over the last 22 years of my service that, uh, no, it's definitely not cookie cutter. No, for sure. Definitely not. <laughs> well, I think it's awesome, man. And uh, I, I got nothing but uh, good things to say about you to people. I mean, I, I try to use you as an example of what can be done. You know, like we like we kind of alluded to it earlier, but we get that that kind of hyper focus on this one thing. But it's like you don't have to be it doesn't you don't have to do that. You know, you can you can let yourself off the hook and and do whatever you want, you know, you can, you can go to the Navy or you can go to JSOC or you can be a, you know, an officer or whatever. So yeah, you're a good example for guys to kind of, if they're, if they're looking to do that, some guys want to just keep plugging along and doing the same thing and they enjoy it and that's good for them. But and for those guys out there, we need you like for, I, I've never disparaged anybody who sat there at the Ranger regiment or whoever and wanted to be there for 12, 15. For no, no way. Yeah, exactly. Like we need good people doing those missions. And if that's what you want to do in life, like absolutely, please. For sure. Yep. 100%. Just do it, do it safely and watch out for yourself, especially when right. it comes to like special operations area, like <laughs> your mental health and whatnot. Just keep an eye yeah. on that. Awesome, brother. All right, man. All right. See, see you ya. later. See you.